the Madison Metropolitan School District Board of Education. And the first item of business is public appearances, and we have two public appearances. Um, first up, Chris Gomez-Schmidt, and second, Chris Carusi. And as you well know, you have three minutes. Um, tell me when to start the clock, and I will start it. Good evening, Chris. Good evening. This is on, correct? Uh, the green light's on. It is on, okay. Um, I am here tonight to um, talk about the class size discussion. I think this is really important. Um, we took a look at this, or you guys took a look at this, back with the budget discussion last year, and I would just like to say that I very much support you discussing this as a policy option and not trying to problem solve this as a budget issue. Um, so going forward, having some policies, I mean, there already is a class size policy um, that is in place and looking at ways to strengthen this and make this work better for schools, I think is a good idea. Um, I know this may not be the most popular opinion, but I'd just like to say that I think overall in MMSD, the class sizes are pretty reasonable um, with el elementary schools um, really aiming for 18 and lower at the K to three size um, and really taking a look at the highest need schools and making sure the class sizes stay low at those schools. Um, some concerns at the high school level when class sizes go over 30, um, I was especially concerned um, at the slide that sort of um, intimated to the fact that um, it's okay if those are honors and advanced classes going over 30 and I think that is a, a problem that you guys should discuss if there are different policy options being put into place depending on the level of the class that is being offered um, and so please you know have that as part of your discussion tonight but I just like to say I, I think as, as a whole overall and comparing MMSD to other school districts, I think you know the class sizes are, are pretty reasonable and I'd like to ask you to have a conversation about that fact in addition to just a straight up make class sizes smaller because I think um, in addition to class size, there are a lot of other issues that play into um, the complexity of meeting student needs and it's not just straight about class size. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. And Chris Carusi. Hi, so I am also here to talk about the class size policy. Um, back in June, when um, the board was talking about the class size budget amendment, there was a very strong consensus that we needed to discuss class size in terms of policy. Um, specific policy decisions that were brought up at that time included um, how positions are allocated and how we're defining poverty. And Superintendent Cheatham summed up the discussion by saying, I'm hearing a commitment to do policy work we want to do next year to make sure our class size standards meet our expectations so teachers can do their best work. Um, and that was great. And here we are four months later and we're starting that conversation, which I'm really happy about. Um, however, um, based on the slides I looked at on board docs, it looks like the recommendation from the administration is to um, postpone work on the class size policy until the district has addressed other priorities. Um, I'm here to say that the board should not postpone this work. As Chris Gomez Schmidt just said, it's not ideal to address class size through the budget process. We need to be addressing this issue through policy. Um, Class size is the <coughs> most studied education policy, and well-designed studies conclude that small classes are good for students. They boost achievement. They boost lots of non-standardized uh, non test score types of measures, such as um, how well students are engaged in their classrooms. Um, if we're looking for evidence-based interventions to help move all of our students forward, class size absolutely needs to be on the table. Um, and our current class size policy, um, you know, we may have class sizes that are at 18 right now, but our current class size policy allows class sizes at any grade level and any level of poverty to go up to 30. And that's not okay. I think we really need to look hard at that policy and make decisions about what we think are reasonable class sizes based on things like poverty and grade level. Um, some might argue that class size reduction is, st is status quo. In reality, um, small class sizes provide the classroom conditions and the structure to do things in our classrooms that are anything but status quo. 
Um, one example is pathways. Um, it's been put out there that the ideal size for a pathway section is 25 students, which presumably is because that's the right size of a class to facilitate hands-on experiential learning and build relationships. Yet, um, <coughs> as Chris pointed out, we have like 104 sections in our high schools right now that are over 30 kids and in violation of our current class size policy, and that's not okay. Um, last week, we were really fortunate to hear from the students in African American Student Voice and they very, very clearly told us that um, they want more time and attention from their teachers and they want to build relationships in their schools. And small class sizes is a really effective way to do this. If you have a high school classroom with 33 kids, it's really difficult to make sure everybody going around the circle has time to talk and also do your instruction. My daughter was in a high school class with 35 kids last year and you couldn't actually make a circle in the room because the, it was so full of desks you couldn't move them. Um, so working on the class size policy is a really important way to tell these students that we heard you, we take your recommendations seriously, and we're um, ready to act on them. And finally, um, class size and compensation should not be discussed as an either or scenario. Um, I think a lot of people in our community right now are concerned that we, the staff morale and retention are at a crisis point. And um, we need to address this crisis through both compensation and working conditions for our teachers that help us keep experienced people in the district as well as attract the new people we want to attract. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we do not have minutes to approve tonight, so skipping number, item number three on the <coughs> agenda. And item number four is the summer school report and recommendations for 2018. And Bree and Mike, or maybe not Mike. <laughs> TJ, I'm happy to Go introduce ahead. the Go team ahead, if you'd like. Get us um, started. Yeah, we're here with Lisa, Caroline, Racine Gillis, and Bree, um, who has been leaving, leading summer school for how long now? This is just one year. One yeah, year in. Second. I know. Yep. Yeah. We're thrilled to have her tonight. Um, we're so lucky to have her on the team. And I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Lisa and Bree dive right in. Okay, so um, thank you for um, engaging in this discussion with us tonight. We are really excited to bring some um, great information as well as some proposed changes for summer school for next year. Just wanted to remind you that um, in our organizational change in teaching and learning this year, the coordinator of summer school and the work of summer school is within our integrated supports department and accelerated learning, so it's just a little bit different in terms of how we work together this year. That's why Caroline is here to join us as well. Um, but we feel really good about the team that Bree has around her to do our best work in summer school. Um, so we're gonna um, talk about some things that Bree has at top of mind tonight. And we know that you have all of the information and got that ahead of time. So Bree will be referencing um, a couple of key handouts mm -hmm. that you can follow along on. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, and thank you again for this opportunity to present to you. Uh, I first want to thank you um, in uh, enabling us to present earlier rather than later um, about the summer school uh, budget and planning. Critical to the success of this program is early uh, adoption of the budget. We can then move on to hiring, implementation, and um, I think we will realize even more program successes um, with that early acceptance of um, our work. So thank you, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to orient you to my uh, presentation this evening. Um, first, I will go over some key elements and an overview of summer school in general, highlighting for you um, some key program successes that we realized in a question and answer format. I want to uh, ensure that we bring up the recommendations that you guys brought up you know, 20 in 2016 to ensure that we realize them for 2017 and talk about the key questions you may have had. So it's a question and answer format. Um, and then I'll uh, bring up evaluation outcomes, some recommendations for 2018, a budget update, and then move to discussion questions and any other um, uh, further questions you may have about the presentation or any of the materials in general. And just supplement my um, talking points and to supplement my presentation. There are two key pieces. It's the handout that looks like this. It's a one pager. I will be referring to it throughout the presentation just um, especially because it has a lot of data and numbers and it's so I want to make sure that you guys can follow along and also uh, the board cover memo I think it gives you a nice orientation to the flow of my presentation especially in terms of the order so if there anything um, is unclear or whatnot you can follow along in the cover memo as well 
free. Did you make hard copies of um, the one Yes, pager? they should been have been handed out with to you guys again. The update. Oh, so everyone has the hard copy. I think having the hard copy handy while you're looking at the memo electronically might be the easiest way to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank Just you. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. yeah. But that way you don't have to toggle back and forth yeah. on a <laughs> computer. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. I have another color version, if anyone would like a color version. Oh, <laughs> They're prettier great. to look at. <laughs> All right, does everybody have what they need? Um, let's keep on doing Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. So just a, a reminder of the mission of summer school is to provide uh, critical additional learning for stu and support students on their pathways to career, community, and college readiness. Um, it provides accelerated additional learning time in the summer to really maximize growth and key skills and provide enriching opportunities to all students. If you look at the first number one students served, um, this past year we were pleased to report that we served 5,530 students in the 2017 session and below it shows the breakdown of the 4k through 8 students versus high school students as well as the student demographics in that area uh, so we offered a comprehensive program 4k to grade 12 and in particular from 4k to 8th we offered support in literacy in math and in enrichment. So all children were able to participate in this model that for those of you on the board who are new, we refer to as the 80-80-80 model. The idea being that the, all children will at least get one if not two uh, blocks or sections of enrichment so that we wanted to make sure that we were offering as well-rounded an opportunity for students as possible in the summer in addition to academic support. At the high school level, we offer credit replacement, credit recovery, first-time credit, uh, work experience and you can see the offerings um, in the section one as well under high school and we really want to prioritize that for the high school model in particular to continue to offer these core uh, components in particularly in those areas and expansion of work experience as well. And finally, um, we want to bring out, too, in terms of the cornerstone of summer school, the key pieces that we're going to continue to implement and realize and really promote for summer school that have been uh, tried and tested throughout the last couple of years in particular are, one, this 80-80-80 model that I mentioned, two, focus on the key transitions. In particular, that's 4K to 5K, 5th through 6th and 8th through 9th, and in particular with the 8th through 9th transition, that's a focus on the students who are at risk for non-promotion. We introduced um, the 80-80-80 model this year, and I'll speak about that in a little bit more detail uh, later, but as a component of that, we offer Freshman 101, and again, for those of you who are new on the board, Freshman 101 is effectively an additional class that offers um, exposure to their prospective high school in terms of a key, meeting with key administrators. We offer restorative justice practices as part of it. They get to really know their uh, cohort of students that they're attending uh, summer school with who then will be their students and their fellow students in their freshman year and also just have that reiteration of uh, familiarity through uh, you know study skills, best practices, really trying to get them ready for that critical transition to ninth grade. Uh, we are going to ensure that high schools continue to prioritize offering this, these key areas of credit recovery, grade replacement, first time credit, work experience, other experiential learning opportunities, and also as ensure that they're aligned with curricula and um, materials that they are offered during the school year as well. Uh, and just a reminder too, with transportation, all students that are eligible for transportation per B, uh, Board of Education policy in alignment with Board of Education policy receive uh, transportation either via a uh, yellow school bus through Badger bus or via um, the Madison Metro um, bus and they receive bus passes. So the same, it conforms with BOE policy around that too. All students get to participate in uh, food and meals provided at breakfast and lunch in particular in the summer school model. And for those students who stay after for MSCR and additional recreation, they are provided a nutritious snack. And finally, we have a heat advisory plan that we'll continue to implement throughout um, uh, summer school in the case of inclement weather. We really try to maximize what we call cool zones or, <laughs> or areas that we're really um, uh, Im implementing cool spaces, you know, not cho or choosing north, fi uh, north side facing classrooms, subterranean class uh, classrooms to make sure that we can really maximize those cool zones in summer school in the case of inclement weather. So that's really the cornerstone, those key pieces of summer school that we're going to maintain. And in addition, I want to call out now some key 
findings, program successes. And again, I want to reiterate some of the questions you guys asked in particular last year um, to uh, ensure that we were really prioritizing them for this year's or the 2017's uh, implementation. Number one, that is um, an increase in enrollment. So the summer school program is really excited and really proud of the fact that we increased enrollment by 11 percent from 2016 to 2017. If you refer to your handout, you can see um, in number two uh, the growth that we realized from 16 to 17, but also the fact that we increased that growth. We surpassed 2014 and 15's numbers as well, so we're really excited about that. We attribute that to several factors, uh, but in particular, you had asked about 4K, um, and, the f and we'd had a dip in 4K enrollment, and so we really wanted to focus on that for the 2017 session. Um, as part of the innovation grant, the 4K program realized or uh, uh, received last year, they rebranded uh, their program, calling it Jumpstart. There was a new com communication strategy around it, uh, additional outreach that occurred, and so we saw a 46% increase in enrollment in just 4K alone. So that was really exciting. Uh, for the program and um, I know my colleagues in for the 4K and early childhood work were really excited about that outcome as well. Uh, we also um, rebranded our communication strategy just in general with summer school. We had more opportunities for parents to receive notification through school messenger, through parent-teacher conferences. We uh, made uh, enrollment uh, options available to all families who attended uh, parent-teacher conferences so they could sit down and speak with their teacher about summer school and enroll right then and there. The teacher would help uh, parents uh, with any questions they may have. <laughs> so we saw uh, some schools in particular, Mendota had something like um, 200 students enroll over the um, parent-teacher conference nights, which is really fantastic. Um, we also, uh, released the high school course catalog a month earlier than we have in the past. We think that that attributed to earlier um, enrollment in high school students, but also a greater enrollment in high school students so they knew what courses would be offered. We um, purchased 80 additional APEX licenses. And uh, for those of you who don't know, APEX is an uh, online and digital uh, credit recovery tool which expands the opportunities for students to take credit recovery. So they're not just limited to a course that's offered in person. They can take multiple credits in the same um, sort of almost a computer lab learning environment <coughs> monitored by a teacher. So they didn't have to worry about conflicts with schedules, conflict with um, other courses. And so we were really excited to offer these additional slots to uh, credit recovery students. And finally, we expanded the number of experiential learning opportunities. We really in in, um, engaged and in deepened our engagement with the community centers through the Youth Employment Network, and those include Goodman Community Center, the Urban League of Greater Madison, uh, Briar Path Youth Services, and so students were able to really, uh, to not only earn credit for their work through these um, this relationship, but also in some instances paid, and, and many received the um, uh, eligibility certificate, um, something to add there to their resume about the success in this internship opportunity. Uh, the board had asked um, uh, to maximize innovative and enriching learning opportunities for all of our students, especially to improve access. So in order to achieve this, we, one, strengthen the connection between our enrichment programs and academic courses and core academic courses. And what I mean by that, for instance, is we um, launched uh, Taking Literacy Outdoors, which used the key components of our literacy work, but also married it with environmental learning opportunities. So we took the books they were reading in their core literacy class and brought them to life through outdoor experiential learning in the environmental um, area. We want to um, uh, maximize that opportunity some more throughout 2018. Second, we introduced a math supplement course for middle school students who are taking uh, or moving into accelerated math. So they are bridging the skills and the key um, material they would have covered in that year is a truncated version throughout the summer so that they can enter into accelerated math having learned those core um, pieces and components so they're ready for that transition <coughs> to their or skipping that uh, year of math in the next uh, fall. Third, we offered more addition, or options for credit recovery through world languages. Um, specifically at West High School, we offered Spanish uh, one and two for students to take credit recovery in that area. And we introduced a literacy skills course at East High School geared towards English language learners. Uh, and I mentioned, of course, the additional APEX licenses, which maximized um, opportunities for credit recovery for all students. And we also launched our first ever um, evening high school credit recovery class. So students who had conflicts during the day could take uh, credit recovery in the evening. And we had about 15 students participate in that evening option, which was really exciting. And we hope to expand that even more for next year. 
Uh, again, the board had asked about the key transitions to really focus on that. And I mentioned 4K and the work around rebranding our 4K uh, model, the Jumpstart uh, program, and really helping parents um, transition to not only five-year-old kindergarten, but reaching more people in the community, more parents in the community who had not participated in MMSD 4K. This was an opportunity for them to have that uh, exposure to 4K before their, ch their children entered uh, kindergarten in earnest in the fall. Uh, the um, second piece that we really Im worked on was the eighth grade non-promotion, and that's what I mentioned. We introduced the 80-80-80 model, and that's uh, all students took literacy, all students took math, and all students were able to take freshman 101 throughout the six weeks of summer school. The, for those of you on the board who were here in previous years, you'll, uh, you'll probably recall that we had Freshman uh, 101 offered either the last week of summer school or the first week of summer school. And we had mixed results. In the last week of summer school, we saw the attendance dropped off. There was sort of a lack of engagement uh, towards the end. And then in the first week, we saw that uh, students weren't able to establish, let's say, um, uh, expectations, a rhythm, a schedule. And so we weren't seeing as much success there either. So we really wanted to ensure that Freshman 101 was not only just offered as a week, either bookending summer school, but throughout and also it enabled us to deepen then what students were able to do with freshman 101 so it wasn't just limited to this um, one week of intensive work it was actually brought throughout so what they were doing in the classroom could be carried in to their weeks of summer school and so it was felt like a, there was a deeper connection through students and through um, the work that they were doing throughout summer school and we're excited to uh, report that for those students who are um, at risk for non-promotion, we saw a growth from 2016 of about 67% or so passing for eighth grade non-promotion to, uh, to be promoted um, versus 83% with this new model. So again, it's one year of implementation. We're not sure if this is, a, um, this is the reason, but we're excited about this new model and the potential outcomes that could have for our students. And in particular, for those students who did not pass or who were not considered promoted, for um, via the passage of summer school each student had a comprehensive transition plan created for them that was shared with their prospective high school so that there would be that warm handoff between summer school and their freshman year so that they could ensure that we were um, wrapping around them as best we can and as early as we could um, in immediately after um, them entering ninth grade and a focus now for the fifth uh, for 2018 will be the fifth to sixth grade transition I'll speak a little bit more about that and finally, you probably are wondering what happened with the pay increase and the stipends from last year. And if you look at number uh, three on your handout, um, you'll see that we are proud to report a growth in the number of, or the percentage and number, I should say, of internal MMSD teachers. So we saw a growth from 67% to 74% of internal teachers. The red is the external number of external teachers, and the green are subs, but those are internal subs that we are that teach throughout our school uh, year, and they actually are taking on full time or full summer school full time uh, position. So we still consider them internal, but we wanted to disaggregate what we meant by internal teachers between internal year round teachers versus internal subs. So we're really pleased to announce that that growth happened, and that was um, when the budget was approved or this increase in pay was uh, approved May first. So our hope is that we will see even next year greater numbers of improvement in terms of internal teachers because the pay rate is known it will be known at the beginning of the um, application period and they know that it will be $25 internally for 30 hours a week so all of that is known there's no question about it and we're hoping that that will improve our um, internal teachers wanting to participate in summer school for 2018 with the stipends, if you will recall, those were around the core high school classes, especially freshman year and sophomore year to include algebra, geometry, English 1, uh, credit recovery in physical education and in health. It also include, uh, included work around the eighth grade non-promotion students um, in literacy and math. And um, what's really exciting about those stipends as a component of their work, they also provided uh, our additional time around parent-teacher conferences, communication and monitoring around students. And I'm really excited, this is anecdotal, but I'm really excited that some teachers shared with me, not only did parents come in and participate in person, but they thanked them for that additional um, attention to their children. And they were really um, you know, welcoming the additional information. So it's a key piece that we want to continue for, um, for next year, especially in these fundamentally important core classes in ninth and tenth grade and 
I'm now going to transition to some outcomes um, from the program. And if you look at your page two of your board cover memo, you can follow along with me as well because there's a little bit more text heavy um, in particular. But these are just some of the outcomes that we wanted to pull out from the report that the Office of uh, Research Accountability and Data Use put together. And so you can see um, that there was a decrease in the number of students <laughs> who were invited to summer school from the summer of 2016 but an increase in the number of students who actually attended summer school in 2017. So we, we took a look at the data and kind of tried to figure out why that could be. We surmise, expect that it had to do around the K-5 report card in particular. We uh, changed our criteria in summer school to align with the K-5 changes. If you remember, it was a numeric system of one to four, then shifted to emerging, developing, meeting expectations. So we think just naturally some of the shifting that we saw in um, the report card may have borne out in the number of students invited just want yeah. to be mm -hmm. clear that you're on the key findings yes, section of that you. memo um yeah. yeah, thank you, Jen. Yep, at the bottom of uh, your page here, yep, the key findings. Thank you so much. And if you look at, I think it's bullet point three, the other two we've already sort of covered. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, and also related to that, we um, expanded uh, the breadth of our uh, criteria programming, our data program that we use to identify students who are eligible for summer school. And we think we've gotten better at identifying uh, or accurately identifying those students that could most benefit from summer school. We moved it out out of a separate database into Infinite Campus. More teachers had access to it. More school teams had access to it. So we think that naturally there, we saw a better uh, identification of students through that improvement in our online systems. Uh, second, if you look at it, so I think that's bullet point four now, um, participants uh, were more likely to be students of color, low-income students, English language learners, and students who receive special education services relative to non-participants. You can see that demographic breakdown as well in the handout um, under number one. And what I can say there is that we are continuing to see um, consistent demographics um, in terms of our year-to-year -year, uh, enrollment in summer school. There wasn't much change in terms of the demographics, but that provides that breakdown for you if you want to see what that actual demographic breakdown looked like. Third, a larger number of high school students attended summer school in 2017 to attempt credit recovery than to attempt grade replacement. That feels right. That feels like what we should be doing, and we're happy about that. And we're pleased to report that um, there are higher successes um, in credit recovery than for grade replacement. You'll see that 83% recovered uh, credit, 74% replaced to grade. And for those students who weren't successful in uh, recovering credit in the summer, many of them are still working towards rec recovering that credit in the fall. And if you look at um, the, for the attachment A, which is the wider board of education report about summer school, we go into more detail um, in that as well. So that's, but we're, we feel good that we were able to transition that into the school year to continuously support that credit recovery. And finally, on all summer assessments and across all grade levels, summer school participants showed better results at the end of summer school than at the beginning, suggesting the students improved their skills in the tested areas during summer school. So we're excited to report this. Uh, if you'll recall from last year, a question came up around the pre and post test in terms of what we were looking at for students. And we ensured that the demographic, or excuse me, the data that you have uh, here around the assessments is all for students who have had a pre and post test. We had over 80% um, in the areas of English um, uh, assessments being um, have receiving both students receiving pre and post and some as high in the 90s especially in the math area so we're really excited that these are and we're improving the pre post test for our students and we're also seeing the results that we hope to in these more um, specific assessments that are testing the skills that are being taught in summer school now I'm now going to shift to recommendations. I'm sorry to go back and forth between the two documents, but you can call up your handout if you would like to follow along. It's under section five in um, the uh, next 2018 next steps in this bottom part here. So again, um, what I will say first is that we're going to continue the pieces that we've realized successes in, in summer school, the 80-80 model, the focus on transitions, what we're offering for high school. All of that will be assumed and core pieces of summer school. In addition, though, we wanted um, to use the newly um, uh, tested equity, uh, education equity tool in the um, 
development and in the ex implementation of um, what we want to realize for the 2018 recommendations. And there's more information about how that tool was utilized at the back of around page 17 or 18 or so of your the full uh, report. So you can read some more information about that. But what we wanted to do is pressure test against that education equity tool and test it out in the summer school recommendations. And it felt like a good opportunity to do so. And so if you have any questions about that, of course, please let me know. Um, but the first and the overall um, uh, recommendation is about uh, site size. And to ensure parity across sites, we want to really ensure that we are reducing the number of sites from 23 to 20. And that is so that all across all sites, there's more um, equal numbers of students that we're projecting to be enrolled. So we don't have these skewed sites where we have over 300 students at one site, 85 at another, that there's more consistency across the board. And, and added benefit to that is it will also realize some cost savings from that change. The next is specific to 4K. We're adding an education assistant in every 4K classroom. One to, of course, provide safety, but also developmentally appropriate support for our newest children. And, our, um, and we feel really good about this change. And part of the cost savings from the reduction in class sizes was able to realize this uh, second recommendation. The third, there are a couple around enrichment, but the first being that we want to rotate children through multiple enrichment opportunities. We don't want one child to have to take six weeks of just, um, let's say, um, movement, fun, and fitness, you know, a phi ed class because it worked for their schedule. We want to expose them to something else too, to include, let's say, art and gym, for instance, or um, computer programming and STEM education and um, gym. So we are going to rotate them in two, three week sessions to maximize the amount of exposure they can have to enriching opportunities. Uh, we're going to, I just kind of alluded to, we're going to be creating or looking at how to best uh, create an enrichment class around STEM education. We're thinking, of especially in the area of computers, Legos, and using sort of engineering and other technology around that to really um, provide students with cutting edge opportunities um, in their enrichment exposure. Third, we want to reserve enrichment only slots for uh, siblings to be more. Um, family centric and what I mean by that is we're going to stagger enrollment for um, community uh, slots we also want to of course maximize the opportunity for the community to participate in these courses or in these opportunities but one for student we don't want parents to have to make a choice between having a child go to summer school because their one sibling was invited and the other child wasn't and they missed the opportunity mm -hmm. to enroll in uh, summer school through enrichment only slots so we want to reserve those slots for siblings so that parents can enroll them both without having to worry about if a space is available. We then are going to un, um, open up enrichment only slots to the rest of the community and of course have wait lists and continue to fill those slots as we possibly can. But we wanted to really focus on families first and having them um, be able to not make any difficult choices around um, who, if they could have both their children participate or multiple children participate in summer school. Um, and then finally, we want to offer read-up programming, which I didn't go into much detail about read-up at all um, in this presentation. It will be a, a, a forthcoming uh, Board of Education update for you guys. But we want to um, maximize the number of children who can participate in read-up. And effectively, for those board members that are new, the uh, students get to receive five self-selected books, K-5, through over the course of summer school. Um, it used to be offered at only certain sites in the afternoon. We want to bring it to the morning so we can bring it to scale and every child gets to go home home with five um, self-selected age-appropriate books as being a member and a participant, a participant in summer school. So more to come on that. For the fifth grade, grade transition, like the eighth grade transition, we want to um, one, sort of wrap around children and have them uh, attend their prospective middle school to the extent possible. We tried to have as many middle school sites as possible, um, but in particular that if they could attend their prospective middle school or at least have the experience of attending a middle school, we wanted to honor that. So we can honor them as rising uh, uh, sixth graders. They're not going back to the elementary school from which they just graduated. We really wanted to, uh, to maximize that experience for them. And as part of their experience in middle school, they will be taking an, a similar Middle School 101 that's going to be developed that uh, provides them with a similar exposure to middle school, uh, you know, transitioning classes, what to expect at the middle school level, how to be successful in um, in um, in their sixth grade year. So that's a really exciting change we're going to be making uh, to middle school. So one, 
attending their prospective middle school. So fifth graders move up to the middle schools and second they get to participate in a middle school 101. Maybe we'll think of a, a better name for it. Um, and with the eighth grade non-promotion year, we're going to keep the 8080 model. We're going to keep the um, work around freshman 101, but we're going to identify ways or look at ways <laughs> that we can offer these children credit so that they can launch their high school experience and have an elective credit or half an elective credit at the beginning so that we can help um, launch their high school career, um, bring them up to speed, and, and whatnot. So we're trying to really find ways to, um, to support that piece of it. At the high school level, we're going to roll out an online enrollment system. Um, we still are doing enrollment at the high school level on paper. So we want to make sure that, one, we can systematize this so that we can uh, have children enroll earlier, enroll online, make it as easy as possible um, for them. Of course, we'll still have opportunities to enroll at school sites if access to a computer or internet is um, um, not possible, but as much as we can get children to enroll online. But also linked to that is we would conduct a similar data pool like we did for K-8 to identify students earlier that if they could benefit from summer school, they know earlier than let's say the course catalog being released in April. So they can start to think about summer plans and, and their participation in summer school. And finally, we want to um, look at more options for first-time credit for high school students, so it's not just limited to health and phi ed, that there could be other opportunities as well. We're going to continue to um, survey teachers. We launched our first um, uh, parent uh, survey that really very much informed many of these recommendations, and we're going to look into surveying children and students as well, and particularly at the middle and high school level, so we can get continuous program improvement and feedback from all um, stakeholders in our summer school, in addition to just teachers and parents. And um, of course, maintaining the $25 per hour internal rate of pay. And <laughs> I was gonna say, am I good? Am I good? <laughs> do, I have, do I have two minutes for budget? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no, this is, this is perfect. I'm just in um, conclusion, I wanted to bring up two things about budget, and then, of course, um, if you have any questions. So with the budget, you'll see that we have requested a 2% increase, and that's across the board. That is primarily and solely to um, support the growth that we experienced, the 11% growth. We want to ensure that we can maintain safety, ensure we can maintain appropriate uh, teacher to student ratios in summer school, and of course all the associated costs like transportation, food services, all of that comes into play with this 2% increase. And the budget has been flat since 2014, so in particular just because of uh, inflation in general, we were hoping to realize a little bit of an increase to ensure that we're maximizing um, the support necessary to be successful in summer school. Um, so in closing, before I move to discussion, I want to thank you again for letting me come early and to speak to you guys. I think some of you can tell that I am pregnant um, so that I have also this other added um, incentive to get uh, planning underway early. We, of course, have a plan um, to bridge my maternity leave, but I am due in February. So my hope is that with early adoption of the budget, early adoption of this plan, we can get the gears in motion to really start um, planning and implementing as much as we possibly can so that when I disappear for a couple of months, um, it will be okay and that uh, we'll still be successful in 2018. So uh, thank you again for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yeah. Okay, Nikki? Yeah. One quick question. Um, I know we're transferring to online enrollment. Will, I know you can still enroll in the high school, but will there still be enough slots open if everyone's doing it online for those who slow dial up? Oh, connection. absolutely. We our enrollment period for um, for K for four K through grade eight is over a month. Okay. At the high school level, it's even longer because we realize that some students don't realize until let's say the fourth quarter that they will need to take um, another course for credit recovery. So we actually enroll up until the third day of summer school okay. to facilitate and maximize uh, student participation. So absolutely, and and of course, of course as much as we can. Um, have teachers and um, other staff available at sites. Secretaries will be available at sites to facilitate enrollment um, as well. And we also provide um, a dial up. People can call us on the phone and we can enroll children that way too. So we have multiple avenues to enroll so we can maximize um, participation. Of course. Dean? Yeah. So you were doing this for a year now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good job. Thanks, Dean. You really Thank sound you. like you. I mean, this was really well presented. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I got three little questions, kind of real specific, because I was just curious as to what um, 
the exam the Goodman Urban League Buyer Patch work experiences. Can you give me an example of what one what a child would one would would be doing it that they would be getting credit for? Absolutely. And similarly, the um, when you took the literature into and mix it up with the environment, mm -hmm. some field experiences, something. Could you give me? Just give me an example of what those are. I'm real curious about Absolutely. Those. So for the, your first question around, and you, you said there were three. Was there a third one? Well, you one? said you had uh, the examples of where people went to work with Goodman, oh, uh, the Urban oh, League. Oh, for, uh, for the community centers. They worked there doing things, but they, um, maybe they had other things. But what, what's an example of Absolutely. What um, gr great question. So around the Youth Employment Network, which is this um, cohort of community centers. So for instance, and there are more members than just, um, I think Commonwealth Development Fund is, almost, uh, is also a member of this group as well. They provide um, in office experiences um, and they hold almost like an equivalent of an internship to participate in an office setting and um, conduct work for them. So a similar um, internship that they would let's say have um, as a um, you know, working around program implementation, potentially communication um, for events. If the Urban League was going to um, host a big gala or whatnot, they would get real hands-on work experience with these community centers and they hold slots for them and they actually are paid um, money as well. Um, some sort of a stipend as well for their participation. So they, one, of course, get the skills in terms of being in an office setting, a professional setting, but two, get to work with community-based centers and sort of grow their network, get hands-on experience. And we work with um, the children to also have uh, this youth in employment uh, certificate so that they can also add that to their resume. And it actually hits standards that are at the state level to um, ensure that they're hitting certain benchmarks around employability skills. So it's a, it's a great program, a great partnership that we're looking to uh, deepen. And there's a group of, um, of leader, a leader council or whatnot that of which I sit on as well. And we meet sort of every month or two months um, to talk about those opportunities and to expand them. For your second uh, question around taking literacy outdoors, so we aligned this um, co uh, program with um, what they're doing in their grade bands around, for instance, water and wind, um, uh, what's growing in our environment, so the plants and um, uh, uh, other um, sort of horticulture experiences and um, what's um, eating for basically the animals and plants that are eating these plants and things in the environment. So they, it depends on their grade band and it's um, in collaboration with Earth Partnership with the UW and they helped us develop this curriculum around the text that the children are reading in literacy and how to bring it to life in environmental um, um, outdoor experiences. So if the school has access to a community garden, for instance, they would um, get to go outside and plant additional um, seeds and watch them grow and talk about the life cycles of the plants. So they, they are automatically given the tools to do so in the classroom, but if they have this additional experience or opportunity in the elementary setting, they do so as well outdoors. Or um, they will follow, They they we got them um, owl pellets, the, the kits around owl pellets, so they could dissect those and see what they were finding, what the, the uh, owls had eaten you know, previously. And then they would go outside and try to find those critters out in the, um, go on walking tours and whatnot. So it's pretty, <laughs> <laughs> it looked really cool. I think it looked, you know, really cool. There's a lot of work about, you know, protective gloves and everything that they had to wear, but um, it was really neat. So for your example, but it, we also brought it back though to the literacy component. So the, cla the books that they were reading in the um, academic portion would marry what they were doing outside. And um, as much as we could augment it with other literature, other books, we did so as well. Nikki? Um, when you talk about the youth education network, is that available also for ESY students? Uh, that's a good question. I am not sure about its oppor the opportunity for ESY students. That I can ask John would know. I don't know if either of you guys know. No, I can find that out. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think that that would depend, Nikki. That's a good question. John's going to be providing a separate report on ESY. It would depend on what the goals were in the ESY IEP related to regression, <laughs> recruitment, or critical stage. But we can, we can get that answer for you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I've got a few. Um, Dean took two of mine. So, um, <laughs> um, um, but actually, start with those. Is is, is that just kind of two things related to those? One is on the internship <laughs> stuff. Um, I know that the City Education Committee is kind of looking for 
what they're gonna what they're working on and things like that and the city has been doing a lot of work around internships and this might be a place where collaboration could be increased on 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 this mm -hmm. um and more generally with most and i don't know if that's already in the works but maybe it Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Yep, I actually am working with um, um, Mary O'Donnell and Hugh um, Wright, I believe is his last name, at the city. We're already, we're meeting this month to talk about ways to deepen our, our work with them. Mary would be the one to talk to. Yep. So, and I don't yep. know, um, um, second thing is on the literacy, uh, on the literacy outdoors, uh, just, and I can put you in touch with them, send you an email with contact info. There's a uh, classroom action research team doing um, outdoor education uh, project this, this year. And there are people really excited about outdoor education oh, stuff. A lot of experienced, good MMSD people who, uh, you know, collaborating with and, and bringing them in would be great. Fantastic. Yes, I would love that contact. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the, uh, what percentage is enrichment only about? Um, as it varies at, between 10 to 12 percent okay, of so the program. It's, it's a small chunk. Small chunk, yeah, absolutely. But when we're, one though, we're hoping with the um, automatic provision of enrichment only to siblings that will be um, a number that we will continue to grow and maintain I mean if we would love to grow it even more if we can get more teachers so that's my that's my goal is to have better enrollment or excuse me hiring of teachers that we could offer even more slots for next year or even looking at other partners uh, partnerships with community centers for instance to see if we can maximize that relationship the work good work that they're doing um, in the summer as well to sort of um, bridge um, offerings and at least connect families with several opportunities if this summer school wasn't the best fit. Um, uh, two more for you and then one more kind of for the board. Um, the t two for you, one's easy, one's hard. Um, <laughs> the easy one is uh, what we talked about on Friday, a little bit about the revenue authority in, in relation to the budget. And I, maybe that's for you, maybe that's for Mike, I don't know. But, um, you know, is this, is this a budget that if we, ma if we max out revenue authority, is, is this a budget in the red? Is it a budget in the black? Mm -hmm. What do those numbers look like? And then the hard question, is um, a lot of great things. Clearly, it looks like that you know growing enrollments, it, growing, growing, growing enrollments is good. It looks like the 8080s working, etc. Um, but what are the disappointments? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Absolutely, that's the hard question. Yes, <laughs> uh, that would be great, Mike. Do you want to give me two <laughs> minutes get, get a couple minutes to think on that? That's why I did the two in a row. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, here you go. So on the financial question, um, um, here's how we look at it. Uh, summer school, when it's filtered through the revenue limit formula, um, generates about 250 equivalent full-time students at about $11,600 a student. This is our revenue authority land. Uh, it means the district uh, has the authority to levy about 2.9, maybe $3 million at the most, levy authority directly related to summer school. Um, Jen loves it when I do these historical uh, stories. When they first put in revenue limits, they didn't include summer school. And so all the districts that had tight budgets started cutting summer school. They didn't make this adjustment. Um, so we get about $3 million for the revenue authority. This budget is a little over $3 million in terms of just pure expenditures. So I would say it comes close. Um, it doesn't cover every penny. Um, uh, and that's, that's common in districts that pay $25 or per DM or what have you on the staffing side. Um, one other major financial consideration, aside from the pure revenue limit, um, is the impact of summer school on equalization rates, uh, which is a tax versus state, local versus state funding issue. Um, summer school does drive down our cost per student overall, our tax base per student, has a beneficial impact on equalization. Bless you. So for that reason, it's also considered a financial positive. Uh, just what are there extra are there any extra categorical or federal funds associated with summer school besides the I guess the food food service funds would would be extra I would assume I guess you could consider food service subsidies yes other yeah. than that um, no transportation no no nothing nothing damn them <laughs> all right um, thanks Mike thank you um, thank you. And then for the harder question, and Lisa may chime in on a couple of these yeah. as well. Uh, oh, sorry. I think for for me, the the biggest one is um, I want more 
teachers, internal certified teachers, especially at the content area at high school. It's been a real struggle for us. Um, algebra and geometry in particular have been really difficult um, to get um, our teachers teaching these um, classes, and it's something that I really want to try to focus on for next year. Um, and certified teachers, of course, throughout the board, but we really feel the pain at the high school level because they only, not only have to be certified at the high school level, but also in the content area. So I can have a fantastic internal teacher who's certified in, in art but who can't teach uh, another class for me. Um, another one I would say is operationally um, around air conditioning and um, the cool zone piece. We didn't feel that pressure this year because our summer was quite temperate and mild but I know that those room those those spaces get really hot especially in the afternoon and I know that it limits the learning <laughs> environment and so how to really um, make it a you know a safe and comfortable space for all children to learn in um, and to really sort of maximize that I mean just short of of course having all air-conditioned sites you know how do we really be creative around that in terms of our our offerings and our program to really sort of um, support that um, and I would say, um, and Lisa may want to talk about this a little bit more too, I think we're getting better at um, our assessments and what we're using to look at performance data for students. Um, I still question if across the board they're the right assessments that we are using, um, especially at the 6-8 level in math. Um, we want to make sure that we see the benefits and the content and the curricula that we are te uh, teaching in summer school bear out in positive outcomes. And in particular, in especially in the eighth grade non-promotion year, I want to see 100%. <laughs> Um, passage. I don't, 83 is still not good enough. 83% is still meaning that students are not as equipped as they possibly could be to enter ninth grade year. And so those would be some, a couple of, um, a couple of mine. And the only ad I would have really related to the credit piece that Bree talked about was, um, I think we have this vision of increasing the elective offerings or first time credit offerings for kids so that we're not constantly sort of chasing the gap that we can get ahead of it mm -hmm. for kids. And mm -hmm. even some of those eighth graders that are attending, can they get you know, some credit in the beginning so they're a little bit ahead of the curve? Um, and can we get certified teachers to do that? So yeah. we're, we're yeah. always talking about that. And that then translates into kids being able to take more elective right. classes it during the year. It frees up schedules. Yeah, yeah. yeah. frees up yeah. schedules. You'll, you'll yeah. hear us talk about that in the next presentation mm -hmm. as well. So that's something yeah. else that we've been talking about that I want to put out on the table. Actually, I've got one more for you because yeah. you brought it up. Is credit replacement <coughs> numbers were kind of disappointment, disappointing on that one for mm -hmm. me. Um, if yeah. you, that's, that's people who get a D and want to get a C or a B. Uh, exactly. Exactly. So I can and I can say it's been un we hover around a seventy five percent on that. We can't seem to get that higher, and that's another key piece that we want to look at as well as how to really improve um, that. But it's exactly that. It's a if you know you get a you're not happy with your D, you want to improve your GPA overall, and how to do that, and how can we facilitate. Um, how can we facilitate that in a in a way that we can ensure that there are the the right uh, components are being offered in the right way so that we can really maximize that because I think that we I, I can't figure out why we're hovering at 75 percent and what we can do maybe to expand <coughs> that into the school year potentially as well like we did with credit recovery maybe there are options to sort of catch that piece up too maybe through the provision of apex licenses um, giving us more latitude in terms of what we can um, offer children there too okay, thank you oh, yeah. Dean or, or Kate Dean somebody over there that side of the table? Go for it. I heard, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. I forgot to ask this first time around. Uh, the first thing that struck me was the ratio of invite to acceptance. And I, and it, it, I remember us talking. Didn't we change the invite? You said that we ID'd people different, but mm -hmm. didn't we also, didn't we ask different, you know, tone and delivery uh, on something like this means a lot? Mm -hmm. It could it, done wrong. People, families could say, "Well, yeah, they're telling me my kid's dumb." Right. You know, right. Or, and but as a, as opposed for an opportunity to increase their skill level and mm -hmm. and, uh, and enhance their their education. So it's w didn't we change the ask to we and, went or, and other than the ID, what what do you think caused the racial jump? The, the ratio jump, excuse me? 
the the percentage jump. The percentage jump. Yep. So I think you're exactly right. We made sure that our community, we revisited our communication around summer school also with our communications team to ensure that messaging was appropriate and um, in particular honoring these children as academic scholars as well and to really um, promote the opportunities that summer school present for sure. I do think a lot of it had to do with the report card and that criteria change because of the, the system, the change from the one to four new numeric um, assigning versus the emerging, uh, developing, meeting expectations. I think just naturally we had a shift in the number of children who were um, identified to participate or invited to participate in summer school. Um, I'm not sure how that will over time sort of bear itself out, but I think that was a little bit of the change. Um, another, I think, is just around um, the because we were more intentional in how we were identifying children and we were and including school teams and we were being very robust in um, uh, messaging the dates and deadlines and whatnot, that's why I think we saw an increase of those, <laughs> even though in the aggregate we had less students invited, we increased the number that actually attended. And I think that that was because of the uh, communication strategy, because of the identification uh, tools and models, and because of the messaging, and the continuous messaging, because we did so mm -hmm. through multiple avenues, not just a paper letter, but also a school messenger reminder, also through parent-teacher conferences, also through um, uh, the, the, the high school catalog being offered earlier. It used to be, I think it was um, in May at some point, um, in 2016 it was released, and that's just late for many families to um, to attend. So I think it was a combination, and I'm curious for next year if we see a trend, if we see if there are certain th activities that we're doing that we continue to see this um, increase in enrollment. Because as at the end of the day, I would love to see anyone who's invited who wants to attend summer school is actually attending summer school. Those things sound good, and I think you should stay strong on that. Mm -hmm. and, and look at that as you can, just as much as you're looking at the other things you mentioned. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much. Kate? So I was wondering, do we have any longer term um, outcomes information on kind of tracking students through years? It wasn't in here. No, we don't. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, I'm happy to yep. address that, but okay. uh, it's mainly been a um, uh, subject of finding the right metrics okay and I think this is the first year where we've come the closest on mm -hmm. having assessments that actually align to what's being taught over summer school so okay. it's just been a moving target okay so unfortunately I mean, I mean we do on enrollment mm -hmm. but not when it comes to achievement outcomes. outcomes so feel free to add to that yeah and, and just um, for some students summer school may be episodic for one year and then they um, attend one year and then they don't need to again or they um, uh, don't either don't want to or they don't uh, need to another year so I'd also identify it would be it would take an extra level of looking at finding a child who one would attend let's say three years in a row or doesn't have a dip or whatnot so I think the combination of just the assessments in general getting better at that but also um, the trajectory or the long-term trend of a child you know attending multiple years in a row that would have to it would be a smaller subset but one that you know would be interesting to look at for I sure I think it could be interesting to look at even for students who only attend once or who mm -hmm. do have episodic mm -hmm. um, periods just because it's a pretty material impact in terms of the number of hours of academics um, and I mean this month is all about kind of big moves in terms of how we can improve student experience right mm -hmm. kind of, and this is a pretty cost effective one mm -hmm. that has a really significant impact on the number of just hours of education. And yep. I don't know if that matters more or less, um, but I think it would be an interesting question to understand as we think about kind of bigger moves. It, I don't know if you would want to do more or have more students in summer school, yeah. but if, if that would be something that we would want, moving the needle a little bit on this is more cost effective than some of the other levers that we could pull. I don't know if it matters more or not though. Yeah. Is so, that question kind of? Yeah, I think so. I Come think here. it's really just a matter of um, uh, a couple things are coming to mind. First, we have actually made some pretty big changes with the way that summer school operates mm. over the last few years. Mm -hmm. It's been a, I mean, it's a lot different from yeah, what it, it used sure to be, um, in both in content and in execution. And that's, uh, I think that's a good thing. Um, 
and um, and I just uh, I do think that with the uh, the challenge of having the right assessments, which we're finally settling into, I hope. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't know that we'd be able to conduct the analysis that would give us the information. We would need to make even bolder moves at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Anna? The presentation, you covered a lot. It was very informative. Um, I guess, you know, my, my only concern around the summer school piece is that um, I, I just feel like there are kids that, that need that opportunity to have those, have that enrichment and the remediation. And um, I just get concerned because I look at the, the low number of kids with IEPs that participate. And I mean, I just know on the ground experience that, you know, certain people are really not invited or said, don't do it because for whatever reason. Um, but when we have such a big chunk of, uh, of those kids below level and not accessing any summer school opportunity, um, and I understand why there isn't any like financial piece, we don't get reimbursed for it, so it's, it's out of the pocket. But I don't know, I just would be interested at some point as we move forward, looking at the system, if there is a way to increase opportunities for kids with IEPs to participate in the summer school program. Because I know it's at 20%, yeah. which is, is higher than 14%, yeah. but yeah. when like 85% yeah. are basic and minimal, yeah. right. you'd want to have mm -hmm. that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I think Anna's question and it leads to the one thing I just wanted to kind of ask or, or, or point out to the board that this is the first um, example of an equity uh, of the use of the equity tool that we've yeah. seen as a board and so I guess either in this venue now or in the coming weeks or when we see it again just I, I think it would be good if we were all thinking about um, how is this useful how can it be improved what you know are these the right questions are these the right way to answer the questions are there questions missing um, and just you know as we're piloting the equity tool uh, this is the, this this is test run number one, <laughs> so um, <laughs> and, and, and you know I nothing jumped out at me as 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 being you know that's got to change up from it. But I think that you know as we build it familiar being familiar with it as a board and and, and, and as a district that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we should be really conscious of it. So can I make one comment on that, TJ? Well, certainly. W and I know we'll have time even at the February board retreat to reflect on how the equity tool is working for us and uh, whether or not we want to change it or formally adopt it um, but summer school is called summer school for a reason it's school <laughs> right like almost every aspect of school over the summer so uh, when I was reading it uh, Bree's use of it mm -hmm. and I was impressed mm -hmm. um, but to apply it to school is uh, not so awkward. easy yeah. <laughs> awkward, <laughs> to do a little awkward as opposed to a singular program or one aspect yeah. mm -hmm. of school. So right. that's what jumped out at mm -hmm. me. Okay, well, thank you again. I okay. think we're, uh, this we're is a done. a really great presentation. Oh, thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks again for your time and again for letting me and do this early. Absolutely. Absolutely. John's yeah. already working on it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And I think we can do a little more analysis. Like if we were to increase the numbers anywhere, what would it look like to try to really push an increase for students with disabilities? Yep. Absolutely. Um, so we'll make sure to do that work. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Next on the agenda is class size, policy and practice and more. Um, Lisa stays <laughs> here. I'm sure more. There's always more. Um, we're actually going to have Lisa Quistad stay and Mike Berry will be joining her and that's it. It'll just be the three of us uh, helping to present tonight. If it's okay with you, TJ, can I just roll right into it? Let's get us started. Lisa. Okay. Um, you have uh, the two assistant soups for both sides of the house, teaching and learning and all of operations. Um, we're going to have the first of a uh, two-part pre-budget dialogue with you in the month of November. And um, we're coming right off the heels of adopting the 17-18 budget, going right into pre-budget work on 18-19. Um, we love this work. That's why we're just diving right into it. 
Um, we have, um, uh, I think it's, this is a, a really interesting opportunity. If we've done pre budget work or early start work, we've often focused first on what our priority actions might be in the budget, which is actually a very small proportion of the budget. Um, this year, we're going to focus our pre-budget work on the way we sp spend the bulk of the budget, which is on staffing and compensation. Um, so these are big ticket items. Um, and I, I'm glad, I'm really excited about uh, going about our work in this way as you know we're in a interesting year and in that we're rewriting the strategic framework for next year and um, that doesn't mean we have to hurry up and try to set all the conditions <laughs> for success in the coming five-year phase but we want to make some strategic moves um, to set the stage for success over the next five-year period of time which is my guess as to what will be the period of time for the next strategic framework. Um, this budget, I think, tries to capture um, the complementary work of staffing compensation, what they're aimed to do, right? It's all about um, driving for improved achievement, narrowing and closing achievement gaps, and putting, um, and setting up our, our staff, uh, particularly our classroom teachers, but all of our staff. Um, we want to set them up to do their best possible work. Um, right, all in in uh, in, uh, in service of, of better student achievement. So um, I want to try to manage expectations. I don't think we're going to solve all of our problems uh, in this meeting and next meeting. But I think what we want your guidance on is what are the most strategic moves now, right? What are the first steps and the most powerful steps we can take in this year's budget that set us up for a series of actions that we can take in the next um, five-year phase that will drive for better outcomes for kids. Um, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it right over um, to <coughs> Lise. Yeah. Uh, she's going to take the lead. Mike and I will chime in as needed. I am not pregnant. I'm <laughs> not <laughs> Mike just whispered. You're not going to tell me you're pregnant, are you? I said, no, nope, that is not me. That was, that was the show before, so just so you all know. Um, you thought you could slip that one by me, Mike, didn't you? Um, so, um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about, um, really and truly. And I um, want us to, I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight um, with all of you around this, and I am going to try to limit some of my talking points. But I think it is important um, that we have sort of a basis of facts from which to build our conversation from as we move forward. So. Um, as Jen talked, we want to really think about this as first in a two-part conversation around complementary strategies, and we really believe that those bolded words there are all important. That um, we really want to think about staffing as supporting high student achievement and, of course, narrowing of gaps. That is what we are about. We also know that staffing is a strategy that um, really supports our employees to feel engaged and supported as professionals that we want to staff in a way that our, um, our adults in buildings feel well resourced and they have what they need to teach. Um, and we want to attract and retain a diverse group of staff moving forward so that we can keep our strong teachers and leaders in buildings. So again, high level outcomes that we will talk through tonight and um, we'll get to the agenda as is listed here, which are the big areas. And we would certainly welcome clarifying questions along the way. So we want to be sure you have the opportunity to do that. Although we'll open it up for a larger discussion at the end. <laughs> yep. Thank you. So Mike is going to start off with sort of um, an overview around um, budget development and okay. where we're at right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is my slide. I get one slide. Okay. <laughs> so um, we've designated November as sort of big idea month, as, mm -hmm. as Jen said. Staffing, compensation, and wage and um, salary combined for 85% of the budget. So, um, yeah, these are the big rocks that really inform what we're going to do. So we're hoping to use tonight um, for the staffing discussion. Next week, operations work group will focus on the compensation plan. And then we will resume um, these discussions more in budgetary action uh, language in um, December, January, and even into February. Um, so that's the big picture. 
1819, um, the revenue forecast is the easiest part of the, <coughs> the mix. Uh, we really know because of the state budget and because of the local referendum to exceed revenue limits, we know where we're at for next year. Um, and it's, it's generally, you know, well, we're not in crisis. It's considered positive in K-12 these days. So um, that combination of state funding and local funding put us in a place where we are not in crisis. Of course, there's always tension in the system. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a more positive uh, forecast than we've had in the past and many districts will have um, um, for next year. So uh, we know that much about revenue. We also have a different approach, really, to um, reallocating dollars within the system which is another really important aspect of the work. Um, last year, the year before that, we really focused on some, some big singular item like health insurance um, to find and reallocate funds. I think this coming year, the focus will be different. It'll be broader, um, more, more smalls in that equation. Um, but we're still doing that work, and it's important. And then uh, we get down to the uses of these funds. It's the same. Um, handful of items that we deal with every year in the budget, just the emphasis changes from year to year. You've still got the staffing plan, which you'll hear about tonight, the wage and salary plan, um, the new compensation ideas that will come next week, you've got mm -hmm. priority actions that will come a little bit later, um, and, uh, and then I guess the benefits discussion as well. So um, <coughs> all that combines. Um, th these are not either or. Um, we, we don't literally say you can do this or you can do that. It's more nuanced. It's some of this and some of that. And um, that will be the work for the next uh, few months. And the nice thing about this is we can hear from the board and the community before the, uh, the budget machine yeah. <laughs> starts to <laughs> force decisions upon us, yeah. which really starts to happen in February, March. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so thank you, Mike. Um, we want to give a bit of a high-level <coughs> overview of the class size research. There were items in your board packet around the research and annotated bibliography that are far more detailed. <coughs> but really, in sum, um, a very high-level overview of the research is um, it was focused largely on reductions from 20s to the teens. Um, findings are mixed. As all of you know, um, there's lots of research out there on class size. And the findings around the benefits um, are mixed and varied amongst the studies. But um, we do know some really important things, um, some I think that we're already doing, and speaks to really the work that you've done as a board to support class size in the district. So um, we see the most pronounced benefits in the research around early grade class size initiatives, large reductions, and targeted class size strategies for students of color and low income students. And then this idea of evidence of non-academic benefit, I think is really important. And while it may seem obvious, I do think it's worth sharing. Um, some of these were explicitly called out in our own SAGE study here in Wisconsin, but it is worth sharing that when we have smaller class sizes, the uh, grown-ups have more time to spend with kids. Um, there's a greater ability to engage students in intervention. There's a greater opportunity for students to participate in small classes. Um, there's evidence in the research of improved staff morale and engagement. Um, evidence of less time spent on classroom management or behavior. Um, and improved student and staff attitudes towards school. And improved engagement with families. So all of those, where they may not be technically an academic, um, result of class size are definitely worth noting in the research that's there. Um, and the research also points out some of these other, um, other effects that, um, that can really be, um, that can go along with class size is making a difference. So what we've learned from that is, and um, looking at all the different mixed research and the, and the evidence that's there, is that class size is really one part of our strategy. And we believe we have different components always that go into staffing um, and allocation, but we value that class size is one piece that helps us to close opportunity gaps. Um, we have been focusing, as the research has, on smaller class sizes in the early grades and in higher poverty schools. Um, it was interesting when TJ and I were visiting on Friday, there are some 
tenants of his budget proposal around class size that we actually see very closely mirrored in this and definitely want to call that out transition years um, and in those early class sizes and for schools with intense needs we also thought it was really important um, to say early on in the presentation that um, we value all of our school staff um, our classroom teachers and content area teachers or our grade level and content area teachers um, can do their best work when the ad other adults in a school are doing their best work and when we are maximizing those people in buildings. Um, we believe that grown-ups in our schools have um, very specific roles to play. Um, schools need someone to supervise lunchroom, supervise playground, um, to you know be doing study hall supervision. So just wanted to be sure we recognize that there is a value on the staff that are in our schools to support um, all of our kids in a shared way. So um, we want to go ahead and spend a little bit of time on the slides um, to show what our commitment has been to class size in the school district and the work that you have done as a board to support this work. I'm not going to stop at every slide. You guys have seen this and you have um, the data in your board <coughs> packet. So generally, elementary, our trend is down, as you can see by grade over the last um, set of years. We think that this particular slide, the histogram, is probably the coolest slide in the, um, in the PowerPoint. Um, it shows you sort of the number of sections we have at elementary um, that really, um, some far below 15 and some above. And it really um, is a visual that displays how we've addressed some of the outliers. Remember we kept using that word earlier on in the year. And um, the upper end of the histogram um, with the larger class sizes really illustrates the flexibility that we used with school principals and schools around, um, around class size, around some principals wanting to preserve teams and not create disruption with the addition um, of another student. So we have worked very hard across this histogram to help schools to make good decisions about staffing and teaming and class size. You will notice that there are quite a few sections that are 15 or lower um, in this histogram as well on the left side there of, um, of the graph. Some of those are um, conscious decisions that we made in intensive need or AGR schools and some of them um, quite honestly really are a function of our DBE and DLI strands or classes in schools and the need to be really thoughtful about um, configuring. So um, this histogram is really a present snapshot of where we were in October with our elementary schools. So we actually have for the first time dug into some secondary class size data. We have not done that much You've heard a lot of talk about elementary and class size, but we are not perfect with the secondary class size numbers yet, but we feel like what we've got here is at least a good start um, for us on that. So that you can see that we have um, made an effort to provide some data in core subject areas that you can see. Um, and again, primarily the trend going down over the years. Wanted to share with you this notion of more than 30 our class size policy hits a couple of places that I'm going to go into with you later. And we tried to dig into this <laughs> as much as we could with the time that we had. And um, wanted to see sort of where the pain points were with 30 out there and we had to do some digging in in each of the areas. Um, primarily our classes are in that range of 30 kind of using the plus one plus two but there are also some 33s that you'll see up there. Um, and um, some above 33s and what we found just objectively was those were in honors elective or advanced courses so this is just our first blush at secondary knowing that um, we can do more disaggregating but we at least wanted to give you a chance to see it yeah and that's eight sections yeah that are really high that's right yes just thank you for yep. pause, pausing here yeah. if we sure. could if we could see um, a lower metric for the middle school ones something like a 28 or something oh instead of 30 I mean I think yeah. that, that, that there's a, a general feeling that that you know it's kind of progressive how how big class sizes people are willing to <laughs> want to tolerate and so some, something yeah. there yeah, yeah I mean if, you, if you're going back into into the data that you would bet. be um, <laughs> yeah it will be a sp yeah and as we look at some of the targeted staffing strategies that will be a good information point for us absolutely 
Um, we also have a little bit of information. We were interested in what's going on in ninth grade and the core courses that are there, so you can see that slide as well. So this is our current class size policy. Um, and we highlighted in blue um, where the specific numbers are listed. And we know that these are the areas where in some cases we are above, or in some cases we are below, or in some cases um, we know that maybe a, a change is necessary up there. So um, this policy right now, as it is written, gives us a fair amount of flexibility, um, if you look at the language. Um, and it also reflects sort of that traditional secondary model that we have out there. So this, I just really wanted folks to have as we move forward and continue the conversation. So the next two slides um, really illustrate how we're staffed relative to the largest districts in the state and also Dane County. Um, and, you know, generally you see the trend, um, you know, I mean, this is obvious, right? It looks like we have fewer administrators and more staff compared to Dane County districts and districts um, that are larger than us in the state. Um, we completely acknowledge that in these next two slides, this one and the next one, that there are nuances to this data um, specific to districts around how staff members are titled, what their exact um, sort of roles are. I will call out in anticipation of a question that our NUPS are in the support category in this one, um, just in anticipation of that. But we do acknowledge that there would be many questions you could ask around the nuances of all of these. Um, but the really important piece is, and I think the, poor, the piece that we want to feel good about, is that the total column on the right um, that we have supported, really, um, those ratios that you see in the total column and should be feeling that um, we have made some good decisions in that. And what we want to do is make sure that we are making best use of the staff that we have in our district to get the outcomes that we're seeking. Anything else on that? So um, without going into a ton of detail on this and without the intent on the slide is not to go straight into the weeds, um, what we wanted to share a little bit with you, um, because we haven't before, is what do we consider <coughs> to be foundational support to the core functions of schools? And when we work with principals, how, d how does that really sort of workbook and allocation process look? And what you can see are really job titles and core functions that we believe are important to schools um, at both the elementary and the secondary level. That is not to say there aren't people with additional job titles that play very important roles in our buildings, but um, we did just want you to be able to see um, that these positions exist. It is This is not an exhaustive list, but rather a foundational list um, that we support principals with. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a, a Board of Education presentation without acknowledging some of the complexities that exist in the system around class size and or staffing. And I was just talking with someone right before I came down um, about this. Um, and we wanted to be um, just clear about what we're learning about and um, really what we're being careful about moving forward. So we know that scheduling is a pretty big moving piece at secondary, at middle school and high school. And we're just starting some work um, to get that figured out. That idea of uh, uh, early hiring of certified staff to create stability in a school and to get the right people in the right places um, is really important. We also know that that fourth bullet around school-based decision-making and flexibility, that's a big one. Um, some of our schools are sort of complex environments, right? <laughs> complex. Um, in terms of size, in terms of do they receive title funding, are they non-title schools, what are the unique needs of their communities, <coughs> and um, just want to acknowledge that based on sort of the complexity that local school environments have, um, principals need more or less support around how to use staff in doing that. Um, some of our principals have been around a really long time and been around the block, um, and we want to support them and support some of our new leaders um, who are in buildings as well. So um, I know I personally work really hard, and Mike does, and my teaching and learning team to remove the barriers for principals so that they can do what they, they need to do and provide the guidance they need to set their schools up um, for success moving forward. 
so um, based on that, we did have um, some thinking about some high-level rep recommendations that really represent this sort of this tactical thinking that we want to use in preparation of moving forward um, with our next <laughs> conversation next week and then ultimately um, with our staffing and allocation process um, early next year. So this is, these are recommendations really within the context of our current class size policy. Um, so some high level recommendations uh, um, around learning from the scheduling work that we're doing and also learning from the adolescent learner project work, that middle school work. Um, and we know we have a lot, lot to learn around special education and ser student services allocation and design. Um, people have been telling us these things you know, help us with scheduling, help us with middle school model. We really need help around student services and special ed, so we wanna, we wanna honor that. Um, we wanna really think about reallocation and repurposing um, versus additive staff um, as we implement a targeted strategy. And um, right now, at this point, that last bullet up there that I think has been bringing out a lot for people um, as we've prepared for this meeting and been thinking about the meeting is we hope that you see and we hope that we're communicating um, accurately that we think we can make some strategic staffing decisions within the current policy. Knowing that as we learn, there may be some changes that we will want to make together moving forward with the class size policy. So here's the money move, right? This slide. <laughs> um, this is the money slide. So after this, I'm gonna stop and, and we're, gonna, we're going to talk a little bit. Um, so as I said before, our current class size policy um, doesn't preclude us from doing these things. And it seems to be working for us right now in these particular areas. Um, so just want to be thinking about and get your feedback about are these the right sort of strategic places. So some of the things <laughs> um, based on the class size research that we um, are thinking about a targeted strategy around are really that notion of early grade class size um, class size reduction, K-1 um, and the AGR in intensive schools without utilizing that plus one, plus two flexibility. Like, is that an area we can lean in on? And then think about some cl focused class size reduction at those critical times, sixth grade and ninth grade. So this would align to what the research really reinforced for us as early grades, targeted student groups at transition time. Like that's the big takeaway in that first area there. Then um, based on what we learn in the special education and student services review um, around really what next steps could we put in place? What schools might be ready to try some of it the coming year? And then what could we put in place um, for next year? Um, and that um, looking at sort of what is sort of the complete model that we want to put in place and then also what do we want to put in place so that we are able to respond flexibly and adjust based on unanticipated needs at schools. Lisa, do you want to say a little bit more about what you mean by proactive allocation of mm -hmm. special ed resources? Yeah, sure. So thinking about is there a way, is there a way for us to get our arms around um, the special education allocation that we have and think about a way to maybe put more in up front and help principals with developing sort of a system up front um, to serve all the kids in their school that is a little bit more stable so that one year they're not, we're down one, we're up one. That, boy, that for principals is tough out there based on the number of students who qualify um, for special ed education services. Is there a way to stabilize that and maybe go in with more early? That said, you still have to hold some in reserve, but how do we strike a better balance? Is it, people are struggling with that now, um, to be completely transparent. Um, around <coughs> the work of learning with the Adolescent Learner Project and scheduling, um, keeps coming up for us um, better ways to support family engagement. Are there um, ways to really target that? And then um, how can we better use resources to support access to intervention, world language, and the arts? We come to you every year and talk about the complexities with students who are avid students and need to get some world language experience and need an intervention and how do we sort of get around that and provide um, opportunities. 
And then we have learned a ton from the past budget processes um, and want to be sure that we are continuing to support. Get your feedback on supporting interventionists at our Title I and Intensive Needs schools. We have been feeling really good <laughs> and owe you an update around this cohort of teachers that are getting trained around the multi-sensory approach to reading instruction. Um, we have, thanks to the work that you've done with us, maintained a healthy base of unallocated um, that we would like to continue moving forward. And then we have got to figure out this game of tents, so to speak. We cut it so close in specials allocation and student services, and that can be a true disruptor in school. So when you add a section, there's a tenth here. We're, we're really hoping we can get our head around that because then those tents are killers out there and want to find a better way. Um, Lisa, my guess is most people don't know what that is. Yeah. Can you explain it a little bit more? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, for example, a school that might have 15 classrooms might have an art teacher that is a 1.0 art teacher. If you add one or two sections, if you lower class sizes um, and add one or two sections, it could mean now that an art specials teacher is 1.1 or 1.2. So you'd have a bump up in art, like a 0.1 in, in gym, a 0.1 in reach, and those point ones are really hard to accommodate at schools and it really impacts and causes havoc for teachers that are itinerant or traveling. Um, and it can completely upset the apple cart um, for scheduling. And then you have teachers who are part-time in buildings and don't feel part of the community. So um, yeah, it's just a real logistical sort of operational challenge for us. Um, so I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop there and um, get a sense from you I will Mike or Jen anything else you want to add I would just say that I mean on this is the money slide for us yeah and I mean if we were to ourselves just decide on what would be the strategic moves we would want to make you know for next year these would be the places where we would be committing time resources which include the time and energy it takes to reallocate resources to make it work um, but we want to get your ideas too so that we're weighing all options along with the compensation options we're going to talk about next week to see what we can actually accomplish um, in this next budget round so yeah time to open it up give it back to you TJ to okay. get some ideas um, I'm gonna start with, with a few things and then open it up and, and probably come back on it um, and actually I'll start, I'll start with this side because that that it's apparently the money side um, First off, there's a lot of good things here. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with you know, the sen sense of the, the proactive al allocation around special education services, but also the, the point ones. And one of the things yeah. that um, a couple weeks ago when I was reading the Mike Michael G. and Greco stuff on special education is that one of the things is that he recommends is doing allocations in general based on a range of enrollments yep. for school stability for, school for these very, for, 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 and I think that you know when we talk about adding a class and, and, and you know if we know that next year we're gonna, you know, okay, we're gonna pull out a third grade class and we know next year we're gonna need another teacher back and we do those kind of things, it, it, it creates great instabilities and if we can, you know, in the long run, open up to looking for models around that and, and, and you know, and perhaps um, seek some flexibility from our specials teachers to say that, you know, that to, to, to uh, enhance that um, and maybe even incorporate in class size policies that, uh, you know, allowing uh, if the projections show us that that this this will be a one-year bump beyond what our what our desired limits are and things like that, but to create school stability, I think that that's something that we should be incorporating in here because I think um, the in and out, the getting surplus, the the the, the being re you know, it's just it's hard on schools, hard on communities, hard on individuals. Um, <laughs> second thing is that. Uh, when we look at both the current policy and also, and, and I think it's kind of pull back to a big picture thing, I think that we have, as a board, we have a couple things before us right now. One is, um, do we want to make any changes to policy? And, 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 and as, as acknowledged, you know, the budget amendment last year was within policy. There is flexibility within policy. There's a lot that can be done within the current policy. But um, as a board, I think we, you know, that there was a lot of talk last year that we should be changing policy. And if we do, what do we want to change in it? And then the second piece is, what do we want to do in terms of practice? 
and practice um, in the immediate context of a budget that we that we're beginning to develop. And so I th you know those are interrelated um, conversations to have, but 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 I think that that you know distinctly having them as as uh, you know we talked about policy and we talked about practice and, and making sure that we that we keep those two balls going is 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 very important in the slide here in the first box uh, on this slide um i think the one thing you know when you talked about the priorities that that, that that look strategic to you i think the one thing that emerged at least for me and i think for other board members and certainly certainly community members and staff members um in addition to the early grade, early grade class size um, in AGR and intensive support schools and, and defining high need schools in some way, maybe those are the right definitions, maybe different ones, um, focused uh, at critical junctures. Um, I think also the, the attention on the outliers. <laughs> what, what, and on the outliers. What is an outlier? Um, how, how far out will we tolerate? I mean, I, I mean, I think that that's the, the kind of the question is, is that there, you know, Will we tolerate high school classes at 36, or is 33 the absolute? Or I mean, there so, some some attention I think needs to be there, certainly in when we talk about strategic decision making, perhaps in policy, um, and so I think that's the, the that's the one big thing I would add for that, and then the other is just kind of opening up. Um, Lisa said that yeah, you know that all our staff is in in our schools and and in this building and in Farm Road and elsewhere are are valued. But I think this notion of that um, reallocations are always the first place to go, and reallocations can mean redesign. It can mean, um, you know, that this is a role that we've tried that 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 maybe we're overstaffed on now. Maybe it, maybe it's not working at all. And I think that opening up to that, um, in terms of programming, I also you know I think of of, of some of our partnerships, and you know our, we have, we're on three-year contracts with our partnerships, but. When we look at you know bang for for a buck, the bucks aren't that great, but the bang <laughs> but the bang is perhaps less so on some of those, and just kind of opening up that you know there's there's um, there's a lot of there's a lot of places t to seek balances among. I guess is, is kind of how I'll leave it for now, and I'll probably come back to myself in a while. But Nikki has her hand up. Dean has his hand up. Anyone else to go in the queue? Nikki first, Dean second, and whoever else <coughs> third. Um, <laughs> Unless Lisa wants to respond to. Lisa, thank you and Go Mike ahead. for <laughs> no. the incredible work. I appreciate it. Um, respect your decisions. I think they're quite sound. On the one thing, though, I have to disagree <coughs> on is the waiting um, and keeping the staffing model the same. I think we got in trouble with special ed when we didn't could handle the SEA thing immediately and waited until it got to a crisis point. And I'm afraid that's what we'll do with class size. We'll get to the point where then we have to do something and do an emergency allocation. And I don't like doing an emergency allocation if I don't need to. And I just not sure that waiting right now when you have 110, I believe, according to the numbers, students in 30 plus classrooms, especially the high, uh, the high school level, I, I do worry about that. Dean. Yeah, the uh, there are a couple things. Um, back up TJ's point on on the uh, being proactive about the allocation for special eds. I I, I think that that's uh, I think you need to follow through on that and with the your statement about loading up up front and yeah maybe keep some in reserve but load up more up front. I think that that <coughs> became a uh, uh, clear choice that would serve us better. It, I, I didn't think we're doing this wrong, but we're not doing it good enough yet. And I think doing, adding that in and, and just going with it. And then the other thing is, is uh, I read through the literature review just briefly once, and uh, and and I want to thank the the speakers and the people that send us emails because they often give me a little bit more information to help crystallize my thoughts around what I'm <laughs> getting and uh, the ideas of trying to differentiate for a teacher to differentiate their instruction in a, in a classroom uh, and at the same time build relationships this year are big focus uh, when you I didn't see that in the literature review 
from that perspective. When you try to build relationships in a classroom, as opposed to the pressure of getting through the material by the end of the semester, especially if you're in a math class or a science class or a tech class, uh, when, when the critical element of building a relationship with the students in order to get to that so that you can get a, a really cool class that's you can then go around and differentiate the material according to where the, your classrooms are at that means time it me it means hours it means minutes it means time in a classroom that maybe with some of the group because you have to differentiate you're not going to get as far that day as you did with this other group over there that's what differentiate really means in a classroom doesn't it is that some kids are going faster than others and then in order to get the ones that aren't quite there and maybe if that's plotted out towards the end of the semester they're not going to get all the material you but you've got the relationship with them to understand that is there's a trade-off there you, you spend time on the develop on, on developing the relationship which we know many teachers do not have the time to do so there's only one way to do that help the teacher get the time to, to, to do that and one way is you reduce his class size so that you can focus on our priority this year is developing relationships with kids mm -hmm. so I looked at the re literature review and it came up with numbers and I didn't care because every classroom is going to present differently some classes you're going to be able to take 18 or 20 but others you won't be able to do that and develop the key relationship that you need for these kids to be able to succeed and deal with the curriculum. But not just the curriculum, learn how to be college and career and community ready. Learning how to be community ready is just learning how to run, be uh, successful in a classroom. So the development of the relationship takes time. And I see only one way to do that and certain, and it almost be, well, it might have to break it down class by class because the dynamics of a class is different every class they go to. You got the same group going to each class, then you've got a thing, but you don't get that. So I, I don't know how to do that. It's a real puzzle. It's not a, it's not a complaint, but uh, uh, the, the time it takes to differentiate <coughs> and build a relationship has to be factored into our thinking here, and I, don't, I didn't see that in the literature at all. It, it's other things, they, 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 they measure the achievement levels and all this other good but they don't level how do you measure if a teacher is <coughs> developing a good relationship yeah. I, I don't know it's a qualitative thing I don't know so that we got to figure this out along with your thinking here is that uh, that's why it's uh, as a default I'll take a lower class size every time Go ahead. <laughs> and, and, and then Anna. And then Ellen and then Anna. Um, we wouldn't disagree, Dean. I mean, the research isn't going to tell you everything. I mean, the research, researchers have to do <laughs> the research. They're like, there are limitations of what has been studied and how. Um, so there's always got to be an element of just our, this is why the core values discussion is so important that we had a couple of weeks ago, right? There's always some element of um, right our values and beliefs and common sense that have to drive our decision making and I think your point is well made about um, flexible decision making depending on the actual contents not context not just of a school but of a particular classroom I think that will be not necessarily uh, something <coughs> we can solve completely this year but I think we want to head toward more guided flexibility at the school level with the people who know their students and staff most to be able to make more flexible de decisions. Anna? For the presentation um, and going through those slides, there are a lot of slides, that's a little bit worried, but you did great. <laughs> um, my question is around our EGR. Are we, are we committing to using direct certification Again, for for identifying schools, that would be for Title One. Yeah, yeah. Every year we look at both direct cert mm -hmm. 
and free and reduced lunch data. Okay. And over the past couple of, couple of years, and both are perfectly acceptable, um, really, metrics to use. Um, for the past couple of years, we have used direct certification. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean, I mean, the state would tell you to stick with one measure um, as, a, as a sort of consistent approach. But every year we do look at both because there, while there haven't been big shifts between free and reduced and um, direct certification, we do believe it's best practice to look at both and be sure that um, our school's needs are being met through those federal funds. So we will use them both. Again, and as we do every year, we give you the breakdown of what those <laughs> both look like, um, what any variation might be, and um, where we want to land on it. So we'll certainly provide that. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up yeah. again. Thanks. My other, I guess, just looking at the information, the, the other concern I had were was in regard to the outliers on that mm -hmm. and what we're going to be doing. I, I mean, I there are very real concerns about having 32, 33, 35 kids in high school classes and even though maybe these are kids that are more successful academically I do think it creates an equity issue if we're putting other classes at 25 and saying that's our expectation mm -hmm. so I would like to see that looked at a little bit more closely how that's playing yeah. out and how we can correct and on the other end too with the classes that are sitting down at 11 12 13 and and it's a concern because I do think in some of those cases there is a bit of attrition so you're really looking then in fourth and fifth where the classes are shrinking. Yeah. And, and when you have one school with dramatically different class size for different programming, I think that becomes an equity issue that I would just like to see addressed more carefully and closely to figure out how can we readjust that so we're not seeing such a dramatic yeah. difference. Can I chime in on that? TJ, I'm, I'm chiming in a, on, in a lot <laughs> it's, tonight. It's, 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 it's the chime night. I just want to make sure that you guys all see <coughs> and know that we don't think the higher class sizes, the 35s or, or yeah. whatever, are okay. <coughs> there, I hope there's nothing in our tone that makes it sound like we're okay no, with that. Really. We're for the first, yeah, we're for the first time getting visibility into this ourselves. I mean, we have not had the secondary data like we're seeing it now. I mean, the first time Alex and, and I looked at this literally weeks ago we were like oh wow this is <laughs> new and good actionable information <coughs> so I just want to make sure everyone knows that we're sharing this with you because we do think there are some places uh, where we need to adjust and um, yeah the issues of students that are in um, some of those uh, higher courses um, yeah I mean we want everyone to be successful and we're trying to introduce more and more students into <coughs> those courses who are going to need more support in them so even more reasons to have class sizes that are are reasonable um. and I, I didn't mean to say that you weren't concerned about it. I, I mean I know we're just getting this information for the first time so yeah. those are just things that jumped out at mm -hmm. me that I would highlight and yeah. You know, I do appreciate the move of maybe being a little bit more proactive in regard to special education allocations. I think the, the process that, well, we don't really say, but there's a little bit of a like wait for failure type thing. And then when it's like, oh, this is definitely not working, but the, you know, that's a month into the school year, it's a quarter yep. into the school year, and that's a really a lost opportunity. So I, I do support being more proactive <coughs> about that. Okay, my turn again. Um, one thing on just to clarify on with Anna asked about AGR and we're fi we have fixed contracts with AGR and so AGR it's whatever we were using five years ago and we can't there are no AGR contracts um, but title one as Lisa said that there is that that choice um, so so yeah. we have AGR in the schools where we have AGR and as far as I know there is no possibility of changing which schools that is right it it was our information that they are not changing <coughs> up those AGR contracts. Right. right. And so, you know, we want to hang on to those even yeah. if they're even if they're in the <coughs> wrong places, we still want to hang on to them. Yeah. Um, point back a little, a little <laughs> bit that, that I think that I think all of us that, you know, one of the good things that came out of the discussion we had around the budget last year is was this level of awareness and level of transparency and digging the data and, 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 and raising, you know, both internal and external um, getting a handle on on where we are and I think that you know as, as has been emphasized there's a lot to be proud of that we have maintained relatively small classes in most of our in most of our places and I think that we do have an awareness of where we haven't um, haven't 
done what we'd like to do and I and I think the question is you know the kind of next question is that you know is defining what we would like to do in in, in some in some fashion keeping this transparency going on it keeping keeping that awareness there and then and I'm, I'm kind of back to where I started which was deciding what of this what we would like to do and how we define it belongs in policy and what belongs as part of this is how we're building budget 2018-19 and I think that that's something that you know I know that I would like in in policy to define high priority grades in schools um, have you know whatever you put in policy has to have some flexibility built in but um, some language w w with strong guidance about maximums um, it, it based on, on what those priorities are uh, and I think that you know that that I'm certainly open to different ideas about how to how to uh, define the priorities by grade and by and, and, and by need in some fashion um, the amendment I did last year was was like you know kind of just a a conversation starter on that that I that, that took you know that the lowest of grades are the most important the highest of the poverty the most important these transition years these core classes and those general concepts and I think these concepts are, 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 are reflected and so um, I, I think that you know that, that as a board in the next week or month or maybe even just this year we have to decide what parts of that do we want in policy are we happy with what's in policy now um, and then continue this guidance within the context of, 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 of budget. I see <coughs> Nikki, Kate, and Laura, and, and, and Jen again, <laughs> and my phone. Um, I would like to see on the special education, the proactive part as part of policy. We had a crisis this year with the SEA. I don't want that to happen again. I think if we are more f open on the front end, then we could avoid a lot of those problems. And as Anna said, a month or a semester or a quarter is too late often for a student to catch up. And I think that if we codify that, that's a very good start. Additionally, I agree with TJ on the whole, I'm not gonna be a hard cap person, but I do wanna know what, a, what a strong guidance on maximums. I do wanna know what a high poverty school really is. And I, those kind of terms, I think, need to be defined. Kate? Okay, I'm going to go from super tactical to big picture. Um, just first, I mean, it, it feels like we need to give some guidance on whether we want to stick with the current policy or not. Um, and if we stick with the current policy, then that also feels like a bit of a commitment from all of us to not go through the budget exercise, or at least uh, if, if we want to make full-on changes via something that, that policy is the right place to do that um, from my perspective. So I think we just need to be clear about that now and, and I can see benefits either way. I could see benefits of changing the policy now and kind of aligning on that. Um, and I could also see benefits of not. Um, so just, just I think we have an obligation to at least be clear with, with you guys about which way we're gonna go. Um, the second, just on the, the histogram, um, kind of picking up on Anna's point, the number of classes that we have under 15 is pretty significant. It's like 13%-ish of our elementary classes. Um, and I know that that gets challenging with DLI and, and with some of our smaller schools. Um, I would be very curious about exploring um, classrooms with two grades in it as one of the potential solutions that we can use to address that. Um, I just, it's a, it's a significant investment. I think it's better for kids to be in slightly larger classrooms where you can have more like learners. Um, and so that's just an option that's in our toolkit that we could explore. Um, and I see a couple of nodding heads <laughs> at least. Um, so, uh, and, and then that what that would imply is kind of doing this a bit to the histogram, right? Just bringing in both sides a bit. So we have a slightly narrower band. Um, which I, again, I think might address some of the equity issues we've got in a couple of our schools right now across that. Um, okay, so those are sort of the two tactical pieces. Um, the, the two big picture comments I had. Um, so I kind of went back to our value statements and, um, and the guiding principles that started this were really around relationships, right? So belonging and relationships, um, staff, 
retention and support, um, academic excellence, and social justice, right? So just kind of big things. And I thought about the big cohorts of students that we have in our schools, which are um, students with disabilities, right, 13, 14 percent, um, advanced learners, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, English language learners, north of 30 percent. Um, and then, and those, so those are sort of the big plans we have. And then we've got another group of um, ninth grade on track, at risk, opportunity youth, whatever you want to call it. But, um, and I just, I tried to f think about if across the board class size is the most direct way to get at belonging and relationships, academic excellence, um, social justice, and staff retention for those students, right? Um, and I, I mean, this last couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about special education assistant staffing, right? SEA staffing, and that is very direct staffing to support one of our groups of students that we know we are currently struggling with um, a sense of belonging, inclusion, academic excellence, right? And we chose to not do that in an across the board way. We chose to do that in a targeted way for special education staffing. Um, and so I just, I kind of, I'm not sure that across the board gets us to the place where we're moving the needle the most for the students with whom um, we know we need to make the biggest effort. Um, I took a gander at the ninth grade on track and I think over half of our ninth grade off track um, is it falls into one of those three categories, right? So it's about half students with disabilities. It's like 20% English language learners. It's 6% advanced learners. Mm -hmm. um, so all three of those groups um, are groups that we are know we are struggling with in different ways. We hear that from our community. And I just wonder if there isn't a more direct way to improve um, outcomes around relationships and belonging as well as academic excellence. So I don't know, it's a really long-winded way to say it, but the last few weeks have really made me think about from, from kind of our community, is there a more direct way to improve our um, schools and, and um, experience for students with disabilities? Is there a more direct way? So mm -hmm. um, it all kind of goes back to this, what's the biggest way for us to marginally impact um, outcomes, right, and, and student experience. And over the course of this month, I'm excited to talk more about is that, you know, more s teachers that don't turn over or more licensed, um, non-emergency mm -hmm. licensed teachers, right? Yeah. We've got some some stuff there. It would full day 4K be a better marginal investment than taking kind of class sizes from an average of 16 to 15 or mm -hmm. 25 to 24 at, at secondary. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, but I think those are the trade-offs we're making, and it's all about, you know, if we're doing a little something more, yeah. would it a more targeted be better, or would less targeted be better? So I just, well that's really long, sorry, but just. Yeah, just in response to that, something I want to be <coughs> sure that I mentioned, and I ap really appreciate those those thoughtful comments. Um, you know, the, the balance that we have of targeted staff from central office to support advanced learners or our program support teachers in speci special education, you know, maximizing their roles in schools and helping them to feel as if they are also core to the functioning of schools um, is important in the all overall staffing strategy as well. It is, but we, so I mean, advanced learners is an interesting example, right? We've got like 25 people mm -hmm. supporting 3,000, 3,500 mm -hmm. advanced learners right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's an area that we know we're struggling. We're yeah. trying very directly yeah. to increase um, students of color in advanced placement classes, yeah. right? Like there's a lot there yeah. and um, that could be a more direct way to improve outcomes mm -hmm. for those students um, mm -hmm. than a class size reduction from kind of 16 to 15 at elementary, right? I don't know, but I think it's a fair mm -hmm. question for us to mm -hmm. explore. Laura and then Nikki. Yeah, I just wanted to, looking at these uh, charts, I was wondering if there was anything specifically to be done about like math in particular, just because there was like, s like uh, 17 just at West is a much more for math classes over 30 than other places. And I think before we were talking about that like algebra is one of the most Classes 
and that's like the entry point for most ninth graders. It just seems like, I know TJ mentioned like high priority grades in schools, but I think there are also like high priority subjects too, just because smaller class sizes makes more sense to me in math in terms of even if you're <coughs> talking through all um, levels from like algebra all the way up through like AP classes, just because there's like, there's something to see at the board which makes even a, 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 like an experienced teacher who can control the classroom very well and can project and everything and manage behavior, it's still difficult if there's like the, the way the classroom is set up, like kids cannot physically see the board or can't get in a configuration that helps. So I just thought that was a, a, a different thing. It's an excellent point. Nikki? <coughs> I appreciate your comments, Kate. I appreciate yours, Laura. This is, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not the best with graphs, but I do know what it's like to be a bit different. And I can tell you at a disability class, we do are going to take up more time. Plain and simple, that's not an insult. That's not a negative concept. What it means is sometimes I think in so, some classes, we need to balance that in with the teacher's ability to be able to teach. And it goes back to Laura's point as well. In a chem lab, do you really want 25 to 30 people? Or do you, I don't think it's the best unless you possibly want something exploding. I mean, it's a reaction. I'm just not sure it's the reaction you want. <laughs> um, but very, very simply, I think that class size isn't going to solve everything. I'm not naive enough to believe that. But I do believe that we need to look at how large these classes need to be. And I think uh, cap uh, saying we'd rather not go above 30 is still a little high. But that's my strong opinion. Uh, Mary? I don't disagree with anything people are saying. And certainly, Laura, I think you bring up a really good point about the math and just numbers that I, I don't care how good of a teacher you are. It's really difficult, and we know that that's a that that particular <coughs> class, and so that to me are like obvious barriers mm -hmm. to doing it. But I am really concerned about going much beyond that in terms of policy, and the reason is is to what everyone said. Dean, you started with it way way at the beginning. Was you know every child is different. Every classroom's different. Every teacher in terms of where they are and their capabilities are different. And by trying to set a policy based on a particular number, we lose the nuance. And I think if we have really good school leaders um, who have great relationships with their staff, who are understanding of what's going on in every classroom in their school, as it ch even changes from year to year, and that they have the tools and the flexibility to be able to address that one classroom where because maybe that teacher is new, is struggling because there's a couple of kids who might be high needs, that they can make those changes and that they can address that. It's not the number. The number's fine. That number's probably within our policy, whatever policy we set. But I think we want to be able, when we talk, I think we have to get back to what the overall point is, relationships. And understand that, yes, there's all these different factors that go into it, the, but, but the more that we rely on policy, the less we're going to be able to take into account the nuance in every particular class. And so I, I personally feel we should be talking TJ, you and I agree a lot, but I'm not about talking policy first. I'm actually ta would like to talk about what are the barriers, what do our principals, what do our teachers need? And, and when we talk about relationships, let's not go to them and talk about class sizes. Let's go to them and talk about relationships. This is what we'd like to see. Now, what are the barriers that stand in the way of that? And then have our policy follow the goals and the challenges that we know that are out there. 
I mean, Mary, just to pick up on that, I mean, we could, I mean, these are all significant investments, right? I mean, we talked very, very briefly at the, um, I think in June about um, uh, conferences at home before school started, right? Fantastic way to build relationships with families before you get into school, before middle school, before kindergarten, before high school, right? That costs money. We could do it for every single teacher and get them embedded and give them the opportunity and pay for the time, right? Because the challenge with relationships is time. So we could pay for the time right. or we could pay for more bodies, right? So, so I think that that's to, do you mind if I jump in? I mean, that's, no, a, that's the point that, that, I mean, <laughs> that to no, me, I don't know what it is. Yeah. And I don't think it's the same at every school. And at some schools, there might be a class size issue. Certainly with SEAs, I actually don't think the problem with SEAs is I think that we, there was an implementation of a, of a strategy that says we're going to cut down on SEAs, we're going to mm -hmm. increase cross-categorical, mainly actually in alternative programs, not so much, and that that, um, I think it, it bit us. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so uh, I think we have to watch out actually when we start to make these changes that they don't have unintended consequences. But I, I, I feel very uncomfortable sitting here at this level and trying to guess rather than asking and making sure. And that's part of the strategic planning process. But I think relationships have to be actually the goal. And I don't think class size is a goal. I, okay, I'm going to jump in a little bit. I don't think class size is a goal either. I think it's a means. And, 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 and I think it is, it, it is a policy lever. Um, it is a budget lever. And I think that you, know, you say we need to hear from people um, both locally we have heard from parents and teachers that building relationships, differentiating the class size contributes to their success, and it doesn't guarantee their success, but it does contribute their success. If we look um, at, at the research, both of those also become clear that, 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 that these are the cases. I think that, you know, if we listened, we heard a lot of people say this last year, and I think if we, if, if we continue to listen, we will hear it there. Um, and I think also, and I also, you know, say, would also like to hear, you know, what else would, 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 would help you differentiate, what else would help you build relationships. But this is one thing that has been identified and has been identified by the people in our classrooms and their families. Uh, um, TJ, can I um, respond to that particular point yeah. before you go on? Because I actually think we've gotten very little. Uh, you keep saying we heard from so many. I don't think we heard from that many people. And I think that if we hear from, if we hear from 50 people, that's 50 people out of 27,000 students, 4,000 teachers. Um, right, I, I don't, um, you know, you, we see what happens. You gin up, you put a Facebook post out there about this is the topic that we're going to do, and who doesn't want, who thinks our class sizes, and then you get people around that. To me, that is not unbiased uh, research. It is not the type of information that I want to, it, to base decisions on. Is it one factor? Absolutely. But I don't think, t I think TJ, that's being, um, I think you're twisting it to say that we've already heard and we should, and that's, that is the consensus thinking. Um, I, 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 I wanna, I'd like to I get didn't say more. It was a cons well, I, con consent, I didn't say it was a consensus thinking. I did say we have already heard and we, and we mm -hmm. have, and, and, and we haven't heard. We have, you know, it is something that um, is, for whatever <coughs> reason, <coughs> has been um, has been something that that people tend to support both our, both teachers and families, and locally and again nationally. Uh, I want to move on from that though and talk about policy versus and, and we can come back to it. I'm happy to. Yeah, I mean, but 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 you know what? We have this. Well, actually, you no. Know, I'm going to stay on it. We have this. We could be doing something else, but the unnamed something else is always unnamed. And, and, or, or, and, I've you so know. Tonight I've named you name, four, you 4K name one thing. You named at home one visit, thing. at home school, school visits. That's the one We've I talked about the second one? 4K, full day 4K. Um, it's an option. There's a lot of research against it, right? Um, we're going to talk about staff retention later and around compensation. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about it with respect to licensure, which we know we have 
and and mm -hmm. I would argue the quality of teachers is highly research backed indicator and of argue developing that retention student is, relationships is, is, is a key to quality teachers yep. and teacher attraction and that class size has been shown to contribute both to both of those um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, I th look, I think it, the it class it size stuff gets a little challenging because we're not talking about a number, right? We're talking about reducing class size, and we no, have actually small we're not class talking sizes. about reducing class size. With my other point is, we're talking about maintaining standards in our district and 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 getting at the outliers. And we're not talking about taking our classes that are currently 25 and reducing them to 23, 24. Yeah. It's not really class size reduction. It's about it's about codifying our commitment, the commitment that is our and and perhaps adjusting it a little bit, especially around the outliers. Um, so it's not really class size reduction. It's about class size maintenance, about something that um, we have done well with and perhaps could do we a do bit great, better with. Uh, and you know, no one is saying that, yeah. that, 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 that you know, the target for, for gr grade K should be 15 anymore, which it was at one time by law. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, even accepting the fact that, that now we are going up to 18 with that, which is a huge change and a huge change that took us away from building relationships in the early grades and took us away from lots of things. Um, the second thing around policy is that uh, I don't think that if we do not change policy now, that in any way precludes board action around allocations for class sizes in the budget process. And you implied that it did. Well, I just, I, I guess, I'm okay having the conversation now and making the policy change now if we as a group want to. I I would prefer to have the conversation once than every couple of months. That's all. So but I think, whatever I think we do in terms one of policy, there will be okay. flexibility built into it and there will be choices made in the budget for allocations to go to go to different categories in different mm -hmm. schools. And those choices will be examined through the budget process and those choices will be examined partially through a lens of class sizes and teacher loads. And that's inevitable and should be that way. And so, I, I mean, I, I, I think that the question around whether we want to change policy is whether we want to codify some of the things we're doing now and tweak some of the things we're doing now and put that in policy. I think that's a separate discussion from the, from the budget process discussion. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is inevitably part of the budget process. And people talk about giving principals the tools, but the tools only come through staffing allocations. And one way to guarantee staffing allocations, go out to give those principals those tools to target things, is through either a policy or through um, budget action. <laughs> That's how it happens. If, you know, you, you say you want to give your principals the, uh, the, the tools, but if a principal doesn't have someone to put in a classroom, which is the allocation, which either is guided by policy or guided by budget, then they can't put them there, period. I, I didn't say what it was. I just said, I just said I'd want to, I want to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Is if this, I thought this was, the reason we're having class size discussion is actually because it is a factor into budgeting. Yes. Yeah. So that's my, fa I'm uh, like policy, I just, um, it's important, but I thought we were talking about the factors that are into going to lead into the budget so that we can be providing that type of direction to, to our staff. And that's m the framework in which I'm talking about and, and want to and believe in is that this has to be part of a bigger discussion. So when we're talking about staffing with regard to budgeting, yeah, TJ, it could, t but, but I will hold, I would rather see additional allocations that provide more flexibility than I would be about <coughs> um, dramatically changing where we are in terms of um, in terms of class sizes, I think there's we just need a lot more work under around understanding what forms relationships than than we have had so far. Jen and Anna, um, I I really appreciate this conversation. I think we wanted to have it to get input on strategy for budget and to see if there were implications for the class size policy. And uh, what's interesting to me about this conversation is I feel like there is actually a lot of alignment, meaning that what I'm hearing from most of you is that the class size policy um, uh, doesn't require a major overhaul. That there, I mean, TJ's words, to, if I could say them back, were about codification and tweaking. 
And I think we would agree with that, uh, that that is where we are with the class size policy. Um, uh, I, I think my, my only concern, if anything, it would be if, if we wanted to codify and tweak sometime in the coming months within the policy so that it better aligns with our actual practice um, uh, and uh, ensures that we're not going on beyond, beyond certain limits. I think though that's tweaking. Um, I think that there are go there is going to ha have to be a second round later on down the line. Um, the one thing we have not talked about at all during this conversation is the total number of teachers a secondary teacher has kind of in their, of, right, their total number of students, which is that 135 number. I uh, just wanted to, uh, uh, like, zoom in on that for a second. Um, but th that is something we're going to have to take on. It relates very much to the scheduling work that's underway. Um, I don't know if we'll potentially go see more block scheduling in the future. Um, I mean, there, there are some decisions we'll have to make that we're not actually uh, ready to make. So we would potentially codify tweak in the policy if the board felt strongly about it. We could do that this year. You could do it. Um, I don't think that would drive major budgetary changes if, if what I'm hearing is accurate. It would literally be more of a <coughs> codification of our yeah. practice. Um, but we would potentially come back and do something more significant around that total number of students at a later date, which is all about relationships, all about making sure the teachers don't have too many students and families that they're expected to right, know and understand deeply and be in relationship with. So there you have it. Uh, Anna and then Nikki. My thought on the policy, I think I agree with this idea of tweaking it and codify. I, I, it is a little problematic when we have a policy that we're not following. So that for me, that's where I just feel like we either have to change what we're doing in the building so that we're following the policy or we need to ta change the policy so it reflects the practice within the buildings. So I do think we need to have that discussion. And I think we're all pretty close and aligned. I, I'm not, yeah. So but that would be my thought on the policy discussion. My, my belief as an attorney, there's nothing that annoys a judge more is when um, you write a contract and then you don't follow what you wrote and then say that you can't follow it. I think that's <coughs> problematic and I think it does need tweaking. What, I'm a, what I am nervous about is I don't like limiting the board's actions to whether it's policy or whether it's budget. I don't understand why it can't be both. I don't understand why we can't discuss it at multiple times and fit the policy to it. But as I said, I'm new and possibly slightly naive on the subject, so I, w I will accept any criticism of said idea. Dean, James. Well, there's no criticism. I, I, I think you're right. It's we do both. Yeah. We do policy and we do practice. So that we do both. So our charge here today to really, Jen, is uh, <coughs> give every teacher a class size that will enable them to develop a relationship to implement a, a differentiated curriculum. So go do that. <laughs> you know? And, you know, well and, then we'll, and then we'll, when you tell us, then we'll come up with the words that there's our policy and there's our practice. So Lisa, get on that, you know? <laughs> <coughs> James, did you have something? Just a quick comment about relationships. Um, and I don't know that the way we're talking about class size is as though it's a major determinant of yeah. staff right. relationship. I agree. I don't know if I agree with that. I, and, uh, I would say that it is definitely a uh, determinant of how uh -huh. so obviously you've got 200 kids in a classroom and uh, they are trying to uh, build relationships, but I don't know that class size in and of itself is even the most important aspect of building relationships. So, um, so I'm going to leave it at that on that, on that uh, topic, but that we move and, and, and elevate relationships to maybe the upper tier of what we're trying to accomplish this year. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not in agreement with that. The major impediment of this class size. Uh, I think there's some other things we, we're very hesitant to talk about uh, being in this group. 
why we're not dealing with the relationships with that. I think some of the skills <laughs> are just around the table. Chen? Um, I want to figure out where we're going with this before we leave the table. And I get a sense that we may be coming to closure. Um, I, what I don't want, and I agree with Mary on this, um, is I, I don't think our time will be best spent raking over the class size policy for months and months and months. I think we want to spend our time this year on strategy, right, on taking strategic action in the places where we're going to, where we want to make the most impact. Um, and um, so I'll put that out there. I mean, again, I'm, I will support you if you want to take the next couple of months to take another fresh look at the class size policy and get the job done um, through the policy committee. Um, uh, obviously, it's your choice if you guys want to rake over the class size policy for months. Um, I don't get the sense that that's what the intent is. Um, <coughs> but I, I definitely would recommend us using our time in a better way, focusing more on strategy. Is there anything that people, I mean, is there anything that folks would specifically change in the policy? If it's, I just. I'm one of those where Pathways is a great program. If it's capping it at 25, I think that uh, where you shouldn't have more than 25 except in extraordinary situations. I think 30 is a little high. That's my personal opinion. That's the one thing I would change. That's my only hard and fast rule. But to say how exactly, uh, that should be up to a teacher, up to administration. That really isn't my ability to do that. I would like to see different. Oh, well, go ahead. I was just going to ask, like, how can they, there be like violations of the policy? Like, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> it says should not <laughs> shall. Yeah. Good it's question. Should not <laughs> shall. Okay. Okay. Um, like, what is to say that, like, oh, let's say you make it so the cap, the top number is like twenty-five. You just delete it and say like twenty-five instead of thirty, and then the number in the table of mm -hmm. over. Now it says 25, so 30 is just like 25 sections <laughs> instead of like 17 sections or whatever. The class policy is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you get a class size in a building other than, if, say, if you got uh, um, allocated eight people to what have you, multiple sections, uh, and then you have um, a school with no additional space, you know, for part of this is facilities. I mean, we may, I didn't want to get into that, but how do you get at this if you don't have those variables? I mean, if you don't have multiple sections where you can maybe make a change, or if you don't have, you have absolutely no extra space in the yeah. building. I mean, so how do you, I mean, we sit there talking about class sizes, and, and as though we have like 10 empty classrooms sitting there, even the allocation. <laughs> this goes back to Lisa's list of all the complexities of class size. Yeah, like it's, it's, just, it's just, this is why the flexibility is so important. And there will inevitably be, be situations for reasons such as space, but going far beyond that. Yeah, so to your question, you say we, got, we may have 30 in a possum, we have a school with 32, <laughs> right. but maybe there's just no flexibility there to do anything with it. And yeah. So our, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And the policy language Quickly. says wherever feasible, yeah. right? I mean, there there's a lot of language that mm -hmm. allows flexibility in there because of all those reasons. We don't want to set ourselves up for violations. Dean, yeah, I, I didn't mean to be flippant a little while ago, uh, but uh, because it's complicated uh, without that ability to be flexible and. Uh, class size is one of many factors that we have to wrap our heads around uh, to develop relationships to get kids speeded up and one of the things that I've been thinking about that could contribute to this is are we overloading uh, our class uh, uh, the, 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 the class curriculum are we going too much too fast in a, in a class uh, and I you know I, I I don't know that, but uh, from the from the instruction point of view, that could be part of it. If a teacher feels so, got got to get this far with the curriculum and and 
kid comes to him and says, I got a problem. He says, no, I ain't got time for you right now. I got to deal with it. You got to here, take this and do it by tomorrow. That's, that's not what we're looking at here. So it, uh, uh, it's, it's a complicated thing. However, I think you can address those things. I, everything that, that are confronted with some of our, our, our teachers and our staff and our students, you, we can, they, these can be addressed. Class size should be uh, on the table. There, w so th that's a factor here. We got, we, th that's a relevant and important uh, issue to get past. And you get a finger on that and say, this is how we're gonna do it. And then let's build all the other things in there so we've got relationships building and, and teachers can, can implement their curriculum. So it's, it's, a, it's a factor and it's, it's good to have this discussion, but it's certainly not, yeah. not you know, we just give cla every class of 20 kids and some less, then th that's not gonna change everything. It's a whole long list of other things we gotta do simultaneously, and sometimes in sequence. Right. So this is one of them, let's, you know, we'll, we'll figure this out, I think. Mm -hmm. Kate asked what in policy anyone would want changed. And um, from my point of view, I'd like differentiation between grade levels in here. Um, and I don't know exactly what one, maybe a K to three and, and, a, and a three to five and, and, and a middle and high school being differentiated with, um, with you know, the whenever possible should be language with lower limits at the, gra at, at, at the lower grades. And I would like also the uh, current language is concentrations of disadvantaged students. I would like to have that defined in some um, way that was, was, was clear. Um, because that could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people and probably meant something different when this was written than we would consider it now. So in terms of policy, those are the two things that I would like to see um, change there. And I think that, you know, that Nikki asked about why we, you know, that, that, that doing both. And I think that we do budget work and we do other work within and, and do our allocation work and our, and, and our other work within the context of policy. And um, policy can, you know, creates limits and it creates guidance and it creates pressures. Um, one of the reasons that I always like reporting requirements in, in policies is because it, it creates pressures. It, 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 it's not, it's one way to get around the, the fact that you can't, you know, the facilities issues, the this issue and that issue for why, um, why you might not be following these guidelines that are in the policy, these, these <coughs> whenever possibles. Um, reporting at least, you know, requires those explanations to, to be there and to say, well, you know, we're really not following it. Uh, we, all, of, all of our <laughs> classes seem to be exceptions or maybe that we are doing it. And so that's one of the things. So maybe the last thing would be to add a reporting requirement. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. um, but those would be the kind of things. And, and you know, just to again <coughs> emphasize that not to, um, <coughs> you know, place any numbers in there that are below what we're trying to do now. I mean, it, it, it's not, that's not the point. The point, right. the, the point is to, is to um, be more consistent with what we're doing now. Yeah. And, and, and so I think that's. that's no, I mean, I think that's, that's reasonable. <coughs> I, I mean, the one place we're breaking our policy the most now is on classes that are too small. And so, yes. and is the yes. one place that I don't see us actioning, <laughs> which if we could address that, it would al allow us to address yes. the top yeah. end. Yeah outliers which we talk about a lot more which are actually much fewer but if we address the the classes that are too small it would give us significant allocations to be used in whatever way we want or to use the money in in a different way should we choose yeah. I don't know. James well I mean based on what you just said it seems like our policy is working really well I mean you just talked about the fact <coughs> that we report out you know what's not working I mean so we're here talking about the over 30s you talk about the under 15s, so I'm not sure what we really need to do <coughs> here other than maybe a little tweak that sounds like it's working well with getting the report out right here. We have the report that says that, you know, uh, <laughs> that we have our class sizes that are pretty low in fact, and that we have some that's too low, and it looks like we're getting the information we need to, to make some uh, uh, some decisions here, so maybe some very small tweaks. So if it's at 32, I don't know that number really matters all that much. It's the information we're getting, like we're getting now, to say yeah. you know, what it is that we need. And you just made a very good point. Most of them are under 15. <coughs> uh, just to respond to that, James, that, that, that 
in the time you've been on the board, this is about the third or fourth time that, that there has been this kind of reporting. And so if it's yeah. in policy, it would, be, yeah. it would be a regular part of the budget process and a regular part of, of, of that. And so that's one of the reasons to put it in policy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the level of detail we had both um, through the interactive tableaus and through the things here is much, much greater than anything that I've seen in the 10 or 15 years I've been following MMSD, the level of detail we've had in the last three or four months. And I'm not asking for a policy that requires that level of detail constantly, but I do think that, that it pushes it towards that. Um, the other piece, and then I think we do have to wrap up, is that leaving aside policy, I think that this level of detail and this level of discussion with allocations um, as part of the budget process and at the beginning in various stages is, is very important to understand when the workbooks are going out, what, the, what, you know, what our school level staffing is. The last equity charts we have are from last January. Um, mm -hmm. you know, people were discussing uh, the staffing at one of our middle schools this, this, this weekend and I said, I don't know what their staffing is because I don't know what their staffing is. Um, I know what their staffing was last January. I know what their budget, their, their, their budget says their staffing is, but I don't know what's been allocated there. Mike, when was the last time the equity charts were updated? Are they from January? Yeah, we were just asking. We know we have them for this fall. So oh maybe yeah. we didn't make it into the board weekly. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, we created them. Oh, yeah, we have them. So <laughs> we'll make sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm I like, mentioned I've that. seen them. I'm glad I mentioned <laughs> that. Um, has anyone else seen them? Because no. I. All right, so really? I didn't just miss it. No, I have no. That's odd. Well, that's good to know. Um, can't wait to see them <laughs> and, and get out the magnifying glass because that's always what you have to do with those. Yeah, you sure do. Uh, so, so I think that as we go through the budget process, I, I mean, and, and this maybe again, this is me, but I think that um, as we pay attention to the options of how we spend all our money, mm -hmm. that I think keeping an eye on the implications for school-based allocations and classroom-based allocations is something that we want to do, whether it's something we want to do because we think we have too much or we have too little. And I guess that that's another, that's one of my desires, is to have this up front throughout the budget process. Um, I, w I think next week's conversation on compensation is going to be important, right? That's the other kind of half, not in competition, but they counterbalance one another. Um, just again, staffing and comp are two major investments. They make up 85%, 85 percent of our budget. And um, so I think before we can know for sure where we want to go with this, I think we got to see that other half of the pre-budget work um, and, and engage in that next week. Um, I would like to uh, have under consideration, Dylan and I can talk about it more later to see how feasible it is. If we are going to mainly approach this as a codification and tweaking of the policy and not a major overhaul, then I'd love to try to get it done sooner so that it's done before we're headed into the, to the heart of the budget process, um, uh, if that's all that it is. Um, so that would be my suggestion. And that seems like it might be doable. I think we can so give that a try. <laughs> you got to try. <laughs> <Yeah>. Give <laughs> it a try. Yeah. What's that? I have to watch back the video. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and I do hear a lot of support for the more strategic um, staffing decisions we might make in this year's budget as well. So we'll continue to work on, <coughs> on those. Okay. Thank you. Final thoughts? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Laura, advisory vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>